Good evening. Um, I'm welcome to the PVUSD board meeting. Um, I'm now calling this meeting to order at 7.37 p.m. We have translation in Spanish. Um, if you need that support, please see Magdalena Maciel. Uh, ben, bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta Directiva de PVUSD. Disponemos de tradición en español. Si necesita ese apoyo, consulte a Magdalena Maciel. Okay, and um, I'd like to share that if someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria prior to the agenda item starting. Each speaker this evening will be given one minute. I also see a lot of new faces here tonight, so I want to take a moment to establish some ground rules. There may be differences of opinions, sometimes strong differences. Please give those speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its necessary business. I will now move us to item 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance. I will ask Trustee Daniel Dodge, Jr. to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dodge, Jr. Okay. And now we will move to item 3.3, our interim superintendent um, comments. We have here from our superintendent, Marie Sheckman. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I got to see some good instruction outside, and I really appreciate the teaching that's going on in democracy in action. Um, I have been invited to a very special presentation in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I'm going to witness a Watsonville High graduate from the class of 2010 defend his PhD dissertation. He was one of the founders of the Chem Club at Watsonville High and he's my son. I'm so proud from the class of 2010. I also want to say thank you to almost everybody, our campaign to raise money for a brand new synthetic turf at Pajaro Middle School is going well. The Monterey Peninsula Community Foundation has indicated they will allocate 250000 And we have a list of other donors that is quite sweet. We're about halfway there. I'm really proud. Thank you so much. Thank you, Superintendent Shekman. We will now have uh, moved to item 3.4, governing board comments with reports on sending committees. This is an opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. And we will start with our student trustee. Thank you, President Acosta. And thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. I want to use my time to speak on the renewal of the CRE contract. For several months, the board has repeatedly disregarded community voices by not renewing the CRE contract, which has contributed to power imbalance. Teachers undergo a two-year ethnic studies training program as part of this contract. It is important to note that, one, many of the teachers in our district who teach ethnic studies have degrees in other subjects and need further education. And two, due to teacher turnover, when a trained employee leaves, their knowledge goes with them, and the replacement will need access to this high-quality training. Moreover, the accusations against Dr. Tintianco Kubales, including those of anti-Semitism, have gone unrepresented within the curriculum, as no evidence of anti-Semitic or divisive content has been found by investigative bodies to date. The personal concerns of outside community members and individuals on the board shouldn't interfere with the progress our district has made with the support of the Liberated Ethnic Studies Group over the last two years. I want to reemphasize to the board that the renewal of the contract will have no financial burden because the grant funds it. We need our teachers to develop their capacity to become more responsive to the needs of the community that they serve. The prolonged silence and deflection by members of the board are an injustice to students and deprive our district of its potential to deliver the quality of education that Ethnic Studies aims to provide. Further, it deprives educators of our district to work, work in collaboration of BIPOC professionals and experts in their field, as was formerly directed by the board back in 2021 by board member Orozco. In my years in the Ethnic Studies pathway, I've learned to address personal biases and contribute to objectives in ways that do not uphold abusive ideologies. I invite you to consider enrolling in the Liberated Ethnic Studies professional development with the district upon renewing the CRE contract so you may too develop this essential framework as you pursue continued leadership in our community. Thank you.
Thank you. We will now move to Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. I'll defer comments tonight. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. We will now move to Trustee Bolano Scow. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to our school board meeting, Democracy in Action. I think that's a quote I got from Superintendent Sheckman. A couple of, I uh, just wanted to note congratulations to the Watsonville Film Festival and Pajara Valley Arts for a very successful weekend. I was there, I know a couple of the trustees were there. The Low Riders show was really fun. Beautiful uh, art display with some of our students' artwork at Pajara Valley Arts. Please go check out the exhibit. Uh, congratulations uh, to Judy Stabile, Consuelo Alaba, and the whole team for making that happen. And to our art teachers and art students for contributing, very cool. Uh, last night, Superintendent Sheckman and I were at Cabrillo College for the Cabrillo Advancement Program. Very moving, touching to see middle school students in our schools being awarded scholarships to attend Cabrillo. We got to see the medical, middle school students and then the seniors from six, seven years ago receiving their scholarship. Superintendent Sheckman gave a great speech. Very, and thank you to Marta Flores at EA Hall for her contribution to that program and all the teachers who nominated. Uh, that was very inspiring, and to Cabrillo. Um, I had a great morning. I went to one of my favorite schools, Calabasas Elementary School. Uh, Todd Westfall is doing a fantastic job. They're using the Prop 28 money. All of the kids there are getting art and music. I got a green team tour by the fourth graders. Uh, the administration and teachers are trying to get the kindergartners talking, modeling, conversation to get them talking. They believe it helps them read. I couldn't believe how many little kids came up and started talking to me and Todd. It is Todd's birthday today. Happy birthday, Todd Westfall. You are one of the great principals of our district. Uh, so thank you for your work. Very inspired by Calabasas Elementary. They had 12 new kids enroll this year. They are now up to 520. I saw a projection somewhere that said they might be at 390 next year. And I don't believe it. I'll come back to that one later. And finally, uh, a musical note, uh, Aptos High Choir, in case you didn't know, they are phenomenal. One of my students will be playing uh, with them this weekend at the performance uh, at the Performing Arts Center. I'm going to go check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bellano Scout. Trustee Dr. Holm. Um, I did attend uh, committee meetings, but given the large number of public speakers, I'm going to waive my comments for this evening. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I'd just like to qu quickly say good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to see a great organization by people at Wansamo High. And I also wanted to say, uh, thank you, Coach Gregorio, for an open house last night. My daughter, who was also a junior there, um, it was a great turnout, and I look forward uh, for Coach Gregorio to continue his vision and making Watsonville High School a great school. And just quickly, I wanted to mention the name Willie Yehiro. Uh Willie Yehiro sat in this seat for many years. I didn't know him personally, but uh, he led the way to help to create to get the turf field. Uh, E.A. Hall and the new portables at Minnie White. Uh, Willie Hero, I know, was a lifelong resident of Watsonville, a teacher, a coach, uh, a leader, uh, a, a local Watsonville legend, and of course, uh, he was a wildcat. And being a wildcat, once a wildcat, forever a wildcat, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Willie Hero, and if it's possible, if I can, we can take a moment of silence. Absolutely, we'll do that. We'll have a moment of silence to honor the Honorable Willie Yehiro. Thank you all, and thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr., for um, honoring and recognizing our um, valuable former trustee, the Honorable Willie Yehiro. I'm going to forego my comments other than I want to take the moment to also 
acknowledge um, the Honorable Mr. Yohiro. I had the pleasure of serving for two years with him once I was first elected to the seat, and I do have to say he, um, even with differences of opinions, he always treated with me with great dignity and respect, and I always valued that, and also um, his advice. So he will be greatly missed. Now we will move to item 3.5, our high school student board representative's reports. Do we have anyone here from Aptos High School? Yes? Our, Aptos, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Come on. for this opportunity to tell you about Aptos High School. Um, I'm Nico Greatorex, the junior class vice president. I'm Lillian McGee. And I'm Ava Benuelos, the junior class president. Um, March 16th, this Saturday, our flag football team is hosting a dodgeball tournament. Um, there's also a choir concert scheduled at 7 p.m. in the Performing Arts Center, um, which will also be a Ceremony for the ceramics. Okay, perfect. Um, from March 20th through the 22nd, we're gonna have testing for juniors and seniors, and Friday we are having a senior assembly that basically explains to them all about graduation. Um, and while the upperclassmen are testing, the grade nine and 10 students will be participating in a variety of presentations including the Santa Cruz, Sheriff's Department, Monarch Services, California Highway Patrol, and Map Reading and Math. We want to say thank you to PVSD who provided us with a musical instrument refresh. We have lots of new instruments at our school now. And then on next Thursday, March 26th, we are hosting a math family connection night with dinner and gift cards, um, a partnership with our UCSC Access team and we'll learn about how to make a math grade of C or less, and we will also be discussing supports and strategies with families and students. Um, it will be in the cafeteria at 6 o'clock to 7.30, and we are very thankful to Mr. Redfern, who is also going to be there. Also, we have prom which is coming up, and our tickets will go on sale April 20th, and we've also, in our ASB, we've been planning a spring rally and a spring spirit week, we have broken up as a class into many committees, such as outreach, sound and spirit, activities, and media, which all cover different parts to make it enjoyable and exciting for, a night, for our entire school. We also have an amazing dance and amazing cheer team that will be performing in the rallies. Also, currently we are in our elections weeks. We have many of our students running for all sorts of roles in student government. Campaigns have been going strong with creative posters, stickers, and very unique strategies. All of our winter sports wrapped up and made it deep runs into CCS. All of our spring sports are set to have a strong seasons and we have had an increased number of participation in sports and clubs. We are super prideful of our teams and have been planning many sport tip-off parties to get supported for our amazing teams. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next, do we have our student representatives from Renaissance High School? Good evening, board. Um, we're students at Renaissance High, and I'm Brianna Macias. And I'm Jacqueline Mora. What is this? Oh, I think it's this one. Oh. Okay, I'll do it. Same. Over here. How do you use it? Right there. Oh. Okay. Here are the students of the month of March. Oh, sorry. The clicker? Oh, oh thank you. The students of the month are Jasmine Garcia and Cameron King. Um, those are the students, yeah. What else? I don't know. Just go. They have a partnership with Renaissance High School and the Rotary of Watsonville. Okay. 
We begin the school year with 117 students enrolled. Starting on the third quarter, we have 161 students enrolled now. Renaissance has had almost 30 early grads this year. 12 students have went back to their original high schools. And then today, students toured the Adobe Software Campus in Silicon Valley. And there are a few pictures of them learning the technology. We also had a we also had a fast fun night for seniors. Um, Renaissance partnered up with New School, and they provided our seniors with a fast fun night. Parents and students enjoyed pizza and were able to get assistance for filling out the FAFSA forms. And as well as yesterday, Renaissance High School toured the culinary program at Cabrillo College. They also took visits to the medical assistant and the academic and career counseling, and they also had a little tour at the beach. Um, these are some activities we have at Renaissance. Like We have nachos at lunchtime, and currently this week we're having St. Patrick's Day week, um, a spirit week. And we're get currently getting um, electrical garage doors for our vans, and the staff room is currently being renovated, and we'll have a lot more updates. We're also getting um, new signs for a lunch banner, a parking lot sign, and an entry sign. And Renaissance also has sports. They're about to start the soccer sport, and they plan on defending in undefeated championship season from last year, and they're planning on going undefeated as well this year, hopefully. Thank you, Board of Trustees, and good night, PBSD community. Thank you, Renaissance. Do we have our student representatives from Watsonville High School here with us this evening? Welcome, come on up, please. Do we have our slides? Thank you. It should be from Chris Grant. So while they're getting ready, we're just gonna start with like our information. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, so we're gonna update you guys on the semester two from Watsonville High School. So last night we had a, our open house where we have a successful night with our students. Uh, many students attended with their parents to learn more about their work they were doing. And also we had the freshman orientation that same day. So this is supposed to students from eighth grade to like see what their future campus is gonna look like and what their like future environment is gonna be at Watsumo High, which was really great for them to have a peek on what they're gonna do in a couple of months. And then currently tonight we had a Gear Up academic recognition event where Gear Up currently hosted an event to recognize about 450 junior and senior students' hard work and good grades at Watsumo High. Gear Up works and helps many of our students, I can personally attest to this, and their help through the college application process. 
So this upcoming Friday, we have an event uh, hosted at Watson High in the Mellow Center at 6. It's the cast for talent. So many of our staff and the students are going to be presenting for this show. And also, um, ASB is going to put up the prom fashion show for students to see what they can wear on prom. And we also have a cup upcoming a blood drive next Tuesday, sponsored by the American Red Cross and our Watson High Health Academy. Students, staff, and everyone is welcome to donate blood and the donors get a goodie bag and then if if they're students they get two saturday schools cleared and we have a sign up form posted around campus as well so um, on march 21st we're celebrating world down syndrome uh, with the food day sale music infographics and ribbons um also on their we have a spirit day which is miss mismatched socks and also students from the department um are helping with this event So we're gonna put some students um, on the spotlight. Uh, so this past Friday, FFA participated in the in the regional competition, and then one of our students, Andrea Puente, was selected as the South Coast Region FFA Vice President, and she's here tonight. So if we can give her like a round of applause. <laughs> also, Sebastian Perez uh, placed third in the job interview, and will be competing in state this um, April. Um, and Tiffany Molina topping the A in public speaking contest. One of our students, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez Huerta, was nominated for the scholarship Every Student Succeeding. So that's very exciting for our cats. <laughs> and then also we want to recognize uh, our counselor, Ms. Nunez, who's going, going to be participating in the TEDx uh, Santa Cruz on April 13, 2024. And then out of 130 applicants, uh, she was selected. Um, so 22 were selected, and they're from the Santa Cruz County. Uh, and she's the only educator K-1 through 12 participant. <laughs> through her presentation, she wants to inspire others to create hope clubs. And a hope club is a Watson Bowl High School club where students support each other on their grief journey to bring healing to others and themselves. So good luck, Ms. Nunez. We don't have a slide, but we want to recognize our sports and our winter sports that had a very successful season, and specifically our senior Jocelyn Gonzalez, who went to state for wrestling. And then testing uh, this upcoming Monday, uh, we have the PSAT for the 10 graders. Um, we have the OPA testing coming back from spring break from April 9 to the 11 and the 16 to the 18. And then our MAP testing, uh, the window for Watson High is open from the May 6th to the 17th. And AP testing, of course, is going to be from May 6th to 17th as well. Now for the fun stuff, we have prom coming up, which is going to be on April 20th. It's going to be at the General Sewell Community Center in Seaside, and the theme is Met Gala in the Garden. We offer many things, and our tickets are $100. And there's also a personal fundraiser that we're allowing students to participate in. We give free barbecue tickets that they can then go and sell and make money back that they spent on their prom ticket. And prom serves as our fundraiser for grad night, and grad night is when all the seniors get to go to the boardwalk and get food and enjoy the night as their last time in high school. And this allows for equity and our prices for grad night will be cheaper for the tickets, um, allowing more students to be able to attend. Okay. And then lastly, we want to acknowledge everybody who, all the Watson High students and staff who took time to be here and asked for their voices to be heard, valued, and our education needs to be met. We value the ethnic studies classes at Watson High and we can both personally attest to their value and impact on our campus. Thank you. Have a rotastic night. Thanks. Thank you, Watsonville High. I will now move us to item 4.1. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Second. No, I need a first. You want to be a first? I'll make a motion to approve. Danny. Second. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And all those opposed? And the motion carries 5-0-2. Um, oh, and a quick sort of programming note that it should have been in my board comments. I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, Trustee Vice President Soto and Trustee Flores both have excused absences from this evening's meeting. Um, moving on to item 5.1. Um, 
approval of the February 28th, 2024 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move to approve. Thank second. You. A second. And all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Carries 502. 5.2, approval of the February 29th, 2024 special board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. I have a first and I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries five. Oh, any opposed? Sorry. Motion carries five zero two. And now I will be closing our regular um, session and opening a public hearing uh, for item six point one: the public disclosure of disclosure of collective bargaining agreement be, be, between PVUSD and CSCA. This report will be presented to us by our very own Director of Fiscal Service, Jenny Eim. Welcome, Ms. Jenny. Or I'm not Jenny. You're not Jenny. She's way taller than I am. Good evening, President Acosta, Interim Superintendent Checkman and Board of Trustees. I'm Brian Saxon. I'm the Interim Assistant Sup of HR, and I'm presenting our a public disclosure for the collective bargaining agreement between PVUSD and CSEA. So Assembly Bill 1200 and Government Code Section 3647.5 require school districts to disclose the major provisions including cost of all collective bargaining agreements before entering into a written agreement. The AB 1200 was attached to the board agenda and has gone through its approval path with the county and we are asking, well, this is a public hearing, so at this time if there's any public comments or uh, questions. Is that the end of your report? That's it. Thank you, Mr. Saxon. Of course. Um, do we have any uh, public speakers to this item? No. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for discussion from the board. Any comments, any discussion? This is not an action item at this time. No. All right, seeing none, thank you again, Mr. Saxon. Thank you. I will now close the public hearing and reopen our board meeting to item 7.1 for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please know that through the Brown Act, the board is prohibited from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items. We are listening. Do we have any public comments this evening? We have a few, and before we get started, there's a couple of people who wrote down their name, but not the agenda item, so I will call out the names. David Romo, are you here? Uh, yeah, right here. Could you please write down your agenda item that you wish to speak on? Okay. Providence M, agenda item. Cynthia Lewis. Virginia Mendoza Hernandez. Okay, so three at a time. Mm -hmm. So to keep this moving, I'll call up three at a time. So if you could please line up, so we could keep this and everyone be allowed to speak. So Virginia Mendoza Hernandez, Cynthia Lewis, and Providence M. Could you please step up? So, hi, my name is Virginia Mendoza Hernandez, and I'm here today because my son is being wrongfully targeted as a bad student at Aptas High School. My son is kind, respectful, and understanding when it comes to authority, yet, like all humans, sometimes he falls short. My son and his friends are continually being followed all around campus into the bathrooms, accused of false accusations, belittled by the admin figures at Aptas High School ever since the beginning of this school year. More recently, the conduct of the security guard named Fonsella Guzman, who intentionally targeted him for walking without a hall pass. Uh, Ms. Guzman continues to initiate uh, arguments with my son, um, and if she's not satisfied, she continues to uh, follow him into class and continue the conversation after the class. Um, so she has made comments to my son, yelling in his face, being centimeters away, telling him, I am the authority. 
Um, at that time is when my son realized she was trying to antagonize him in losing his school, so he did not. Uh, he did what he should have. He excused himself and walked away. I attempted to bring this up to the vice principal, Mr. B, only to have my child followed again into the bathroom Excuse today. That, that was a minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Hi, my name is Cynthia Lewis, and good evening. I'm currently Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice for the Social Science Division of, at UCSC, and I'm also former chair and current professor of education. Um, this is the second time that I've come to speak to the board to ask them to trust their hardworking and knowledgeable teachers and students and reinstate the CRE contract. Last time I talked about the fact that there's no evidence of anti-Semitism in the work of CRT, uh, CRE. This time I'm going to speak to you as a scholar of education who is well versed in the quantitative and qualitative research that supports the teaching of K-12 ethnic studies. Since qualitative research tends to hold more sway with school boards, I'm happy to report that there are co quantitative causal studies that show that enrollment in ethnic studies has positively impacted attendance, overall GPA, credit accumulation, increases in standardized pass rates, student performance, high school graduation, and the probability of enrolling in college. You might hear from non-experts who tell you that this isn't true. But those people are not scholars of education, and they are not knowledgeable readers of the research. Excuse me, that, they, that was a, a minute. Oh, OK. Thank I you very much. stop there. <clears throat> Good evening, board and everybody here from the community. My name is Providence Martinez Alanis. And I just wanted to um, tell you that it's ex extremely important to have ethnic studies in our in our curriculum, in our community, because it's um, by including these these perspectives and histories in our education system, we can ensure that all students feel seen, valued, and included. It's also allowing students to better understand the complexities of the world around them and to develop empathy and understand for people from different backgrounds. In order to truly make our kids a priority, we need to prioritize their education by providing a well-rounded, inclusive curriculum that proposes them to thrive in a diverse and interconnected world. Our staff should also make it a priority to incorporate ethnic studies into the teachings to ensure that all students have access to the important knowledge. Thank you very much. All right. So the next three that we have, David Romo, the Pajaro Valley Historical Association, and Edgar Guerrero. And just a reminder, we have a minute, so please stay okay. within your... All right, I got it. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, last de December, we met with um, your organization, uh, specifically Brian Saxton, and he basically gave us no hope. Um, I'm an LPAC tester, and because... They have different classifications for LPAC testers, one being a substitute, another being a retired teacher. You have a class of, of, of people that are being basically neglected. So as of now, I'm getting a 4% decrease in my pay. So I'm getting paid less to do the same job I did last year. And it doesn't seem like anybody's listening. Nobody is listening. I understand, I just found out today that the staff, classified staff got a pay increase, great for them. Bonuses, $4,000, give us one dollar, $1, give us two dollars an hour. Come on guys, this is ridiculous. Did you know that 29 ethnic peoples have come to the Pajaro Valley? Did you know that in 2012, 20 foreign languages were spoken in our school system? Did you know that in 1900, the second largest Chinatown in the U.S. was here? It burnt down twice. Did you know that in 1900, the largest Japanese population in the U.S. was here in the Monterey Bay? Did you know that in early California, some wanted to make this a slave state, 
and have the indigenous and Asians be slaves. Did you know that one third of the Chinese or Japanese children born in the first two decades of the 20th century died in the first seven to 10 days? Did you know that Mexicans were deported in the 30s and then brought back in the 40s with the Bracero program? Of course you did not know this history. I did not know this history a year ago. I invite you to a board training session on the rich but complicated history of the Pajaro Valley presented by the Pajaro Valley Historical Association. Thank you. Hello, my name is Edgar Guerrero. I'm in eighth grade and I go to Rolling Hills Middle School. I've been watching the past couple of board meetings and it seems like you're consistently ignoring the community. I'm coming to this board meeting to ask why are you refusing to support the ethnic studies teachers? Renewing the CRE contract is the best way to support the teachers and students. I have been hesitant to come because I don't feel that you will listen to my voice. I feel that an, that an opportunity is being taken away from me and my classmates. I want to learn about my history, culture, and identity. I want to get the class that the students are currently taking, not a watered down version because this, of your decision to not renew the contract. Please put this back on the agenda. Thank you. The, the next three speakers are Judy Baker, Giancarlo, and Barbie Marsalt. Hi, good evening. I'm back, and uh, thank you, uh, Superintendent Shackman, for coming to uh, Shackman. Sorry for coming to our school yesterday and. Uh, giving us so much information and, and hope for our campus. I brought photos today because while everyone can't come to everything and um, photos say so much, am I allowed to distribute this or hand it to you guys at all? To, to Eva? Okay. Okay, cool. And if you guys could just take a look at it, it speaks to the, um, well, our, we don't have uh, operational bathrooms at this point. We have one portable uh, at our elementary school that still operates, um, but it's more so for the middle school kids. And we have porta potties for the rest. So we love bathrooms. <laughs> All right. uh, good evening. My name is John Carlo Mendo. I am a senior at Watsonville High School, and I'm here today to talk about the CRE. The CRE contract needs to stay. This class, just by itself, has impacted me and many others in so many different ways as well. It has taught us ways of oppression and what is right from the wrong. It is also very unacceptable that we are also being ignored. We have been to many meetings to speak about what we want and we feel ignored. Please, and just please, bring back the contract. Not just for us, but the future generations of our schools. Please consider bringing back this contract. Just look at all of us. We need your support. Thank you. Hi, board. Bobby, uh, teacher, parent, please put CRE back on the agenda. Um, I don't have time in one minute to go into some of my work as a minister in interfaith uh, dialogue, but I'd love to have that conversation if you ever want. Um, what I am concerned about is this seems to be an ongoing concern for me that our district does not respect our teachers. And the reason I say that, number one, you have had, I think you think that it doesn't hurt the ethnic studies program because we have it, yet you've had paid professionals continually showing up saying, no, we need this. Please believe them. I say it's a trend because we are also, the district is about to spend a whole bunch of money on attorneys for arbitration for days that teachers took off that you decided to dock pay and, uh, you know, or would rather pay attorneys rather than the teachers. Um, why has the board not stepped in to change that? Why has uh, our superintendent not stepped in to change that? Please, our money should not be, uh, pay the teachers, not the attorneys, please. Trust the teachers who are telling you that this is a, a helpful need in the district. Put it back on the, uh, on the agenda and share what your concerns are on the record. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Mike Floor, Bill Bunzel and Christine Hong. Hello, hello. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, because I only have a minute, good evening, board. Um, I'm going to address what David brought up about LPAC tester pay. Um, last December, I was going to come talk about it, and Brian Saxton talked me out of bringing it up with you. He said that we could handle it on our own. And then we went into his office, me and David and our director, and we were basically bullied and told there was no hope for us that that was the rate that we would get paid. Now, we're in LPAC testing season right now. There's 6,000 kids that need to do it. It's a state mandated test, yet we're being treated like it's superficial. So CWA, our union, I'm a steward of the union. I'm invoking my wine garden rights right now. We are gonna be talking about LPAC tester rate in our union. So I will continue this conversation when I have my five minutes with David during the CWA time. And I'm gonna to continue to talk about LPAC testing rate during CWA time. No one's gonna stop me, thank you. Good evening, board. Good evening, board. My name is Bill Bonsell, and I'm here to speak about policies regarding sex offenders on campus. I'm going to speak fast because I got a minute. I'm a new substitute teacher at Watsonville High School, but it'll be my fifth season as a football coach here, and I've uh, coached 10 years at Watsonville. I'm sorry, uh, Aptos. Professionally, I'm a retired probation officer, in Santa Clara County, after serving 30 years. My last assignment, uh, I supervised uh, the adult sex offenders for 13 years. Um, I'm a certified expert trainer on the topic in the state of California and have conducted, conducted trainings nationally. I've been invited by State uh, Senator Elaine Alquist to testify for a safety committee. And I was recognized by chief probation officers throughout the state for my work with sex offender population, being awarded the probation officer of the year for the Bay Area region as well as the entire state. My dealings with principals as a probation officer, um, I have found that they collectively am prepared to deal with sex offenders. That's why I reached out to Mr. Sheckman through uh, Ms. Renteria and she provided me with a copy of the policy. And I have it here, which is, it's kind of scary. Any person who is, uh, well, yeah. speaking of that, I have in my hand today's minutes and it says two minutes each. You guys had an opportunity to say one minute on there, but um, may I just say that this policy is a, is a disaster by and it's, followed with no procedural rules for principals to follow. Um, and you're putting students and staff at risk. And thank, uh, by the way, I haven't received yeah, any response thank you. back. Thank you. My name is Christine Hong. I'm at UC Santa Cruz, where I served as the inaugural chair of the Department of Critical Race and Ethnic Studies. Ethnic studies is a structurally transformative field of study. It dares to center an analysis of power and structural violence from the perspectives of the people most impacted by it. It dares to imagine that our struggles for liberation are deeply connected. It dares to put knowledge into action for the benefit of the greatest possible collective, not just the powerful few. The irony is not lost on us that there is a racialized power structure here and the autocratic power wielded by the PBUSD board and figures like Kim DeSerpa are precisely the kind of undemocratic status quo that ethnic studies seeks to challenge. Watsonville is majority people of color, but what you have shown us is that the power structure here is ideologically white. 90% of the students in this district are from communities of color. The California student body is 80% students, thank, people of color. Thank you very much. Yet so a you deny them ethnic studies. You have a slender chance to do right by the people of Watsonville, but don't overestimate your own authority. Thank the tide of much. history has shifted. Do the right thing. Thank you. The next three speakers are Alma Sanchez, Karina Moreno, and Gil Stein. Well, there used to be a clock up there. Uh, anyway, my name is Gil Stein, and I disagree with about 99% of what's been said already here. Uh, back in the September, you voted not to end ethnic studies, but just to not renew the contract of CRE. That was the right decision then, and it's the right decision now. 
I believe that six months ago you made the correct decision and what has transpired ever since <laughs> has just verified my thoughts. There's been a 400% increase in anti-Semitism in our country since those last six months. A Anti-Semitic attacks uh, against uh, Trustee Deserpa have increased because of her opposition to renewing the contract with CRA. You've just seen that right now. That by itself should tell you folks something. It is time to let the board continue dealing with the pressing issues that directly concern the PVUSD, such as finding a new superintendent, enacting a budget, dec dealing with declining enrollment, and other issues that ha require immediate attention. Complaining about issues that have already been decided is not the best use of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we move to the next public speaker, I'd like to remind the public of the comment that I made in the beginning. We all need to treat one another with dignity and respect in this room so everybody's voice can be heard, even if you disagree with that voice. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk as fast as I can because one minute is nowhere near enough. Um, good afternoon. My name is Alma. I was born and raised in Watsonville, California. I'm a graduate of Pajar Valley High School. Um, I'm a, I've attended all my years of education at PVUSD. Um, I'm a current student at Cabrillo College studying environmental studies. Um, I'd like to ask to reinstate the CRE contract into the next meeting's agenda. Um, I took Ethnic Studies 1 and 2 in high school and I want to emphasize that I would not be who I am today in the spaces I am today, making the change in my community I am today had I not taken these courses in high school. Um, these courses allowed me to explore so many concepts that shaped my values and goals in my personal life and the goals that I have for my community. Um, these were the first classes I had ever taken in school that encouraged me to ask why. Why don't I feel connected to my Mexican culture? Why are the teachers from my school leaving to teach somewhere else? Not only why, but what can I do about it? It gave me, wow, okay. Thank, thank you. Hi, buenas noches, my name is Karina Moreno, um, and I'm also here to support the CRE contract, asking you guys to please put it on next meeting's agenda so that we can actually have a conversation with you. It's really hard to come up here and talk to you about it and then hear nothing for months and months and months. And I want to thank everyone who's come out today and continue to come out. Um, and I really want to emphasize that ethnic studies is about like learning our specific legacies, the social, cultural, economic, and political experiences of our people. We just want our stories. They just want their histories. Let them stand on the shoulders of their ancestors and let them know who it is that they're representing, how far they can go because people have already brought them here. So if you'll please look, like everyone wants this. And don't listen to the people who who'd had the privilege actually to learn their own histories. Please allow us to learn our own histories. Before we go out into the world, let them ground themselves here. Give them that education, please, to, to learn empathy, community actualization, and self-worth. Thank you. The next, three, the next three speakers are Manuel Barzamin, Yesenia Jimenez, and Angel Ponce. So if you guys could come line up, please. Thank you. As the first mayor of Watsonville of Asian descent, first Mexican-American mayor, farm worker family of Watsonville, educated by Stanford Jewish professors, I want to invoke the spirit of Willie Hero. Willie Hero would never say no to learning the rich tapestry of ethnic communities in this valley. Willie was a fighter. Those of you who served with him knew he was a fighter. And he'd be here saying, we need the whole community to learn about the Japanese American, the Chinese American, the Filipino Americans, the Mexican immigrants. So I, I got to tell you guys this. In eight years on the Watsonville City Council, did we never limit anybody who came to speak to us to one minute? Never. So I, I just hope that the superintendent entertains a proposal to have a special meeting on restoring ethnic studies in this district. Our youth represent the new, democra the, the new demographics and they need to know who they are so they know where they're going. Thank you. Okay, 
Hi, my name is Yesenia Jimenez. Um, I do environmental education in the district. I grew up in this district. All of my nieces and nephews go to school in this district. And if you cannot hear by how much those types of classes for critical race and ethnic studies classes affect the students, like literally Alma does so much work with Esperanza Community Farms. I see some of my other students here. This is really impactful. I was a super nerd in high school, like 4.2 GPA, A's like fives and fours on my AP test and history was one of my favorite subjects and even getting to college I felt like I didn't know anything and I even though I majored in biology I minored in Latin American studies because it was mind-blowing to me how much intersectionality I had missed in the basic basic education that I got in high school you hear other students talking about how impactful it is I always wondered if we had that kind of stuff in high school if more of my peers would have graduated and someone just said that statistically it improves class attendance so if you want better test scores students need to be excited about what they're learning and it's sad that you guys even voted to take this away disappointing <laughs> Hi, my name is Angel Ponce. I'm also a graduate of PVUSD District. Um, I, gra or I graduated in 2018 and I live in Sector 7, I think. Um, and I want to echo the voices here saying that CRE is needed. And I want to say that I didn't take ethnic studies in the district because it wasn't exposed to me. I, didn't, I had to go all the way to LA to even learn any Mexican history because it wasn't emphasized here. I had to join Mecha, which many students here don't even know what it is, but guess what? They also had to fight for ethnic studies in the 60s. Your cycle of history is repeating. Do not erase these voices. Do not allow um, white people to teach our history or to like overpower that history. Let us do our own um, curriculum and emphasize the voices of students. Thank you. So the next three are Syria Sorensen. I think it's Shrestha and Sarah Salazar Hughes. And then So Sir you're both coming up to speak in one minute on the same card? Yeah, they're just she's gonna okay. stand. And, and okay. right behind you is Sergio Jesus Medina and Andrea Puente. Good evening, I'm Shreya Shreshta and this is uh, Sarah Salazar Hughes and we're here together because we both teach um, ethnic studies and racial justice related courses at Cal State University Monterey Bay. And like many of the people here, we just want to express um, our concern about the ending of the CRE contract. As instructors at CSUMB, many of our students um, come from the Tri-County area. We have many students um, from PVUSD and similar districts. And we know um, we've also been involved in a lot of projects to localize ethnic studies. And we can really attest to the fact that, as many people have already stated, having community-engaged ethnic studies courses at the K through 12 level is invaluable in supporting uh, the success of all students, but particularly students of color. And um, programs like CRE are actually incredibly important because of their emphasis on getting K through 12 educators to localize their curriculum, to engage with the histories and experiences of their students and the communities that they come from. And um, it's really a shame that because of the one, concerns one of a small group of right-wing organizers with their own agenda, you're doing a disservice to your students and your community. So, thank you. Hello, I'm Sergio Ramos Sr. at Westonville High School. I'm pretty sure you know me from last board meeting. Uh, and I could be honest, I really wish I shouldn't be here. I just got out of volleyball practice and I'm trying not to worry about the CRE contract not being renewed. Um, and as my uh, Mr. Pels, my ethnic studies teacher told me, I'm gonna speak from the heart and I hope you listen from the heart. There's a such thing called institutional oppression and that is when you people that have power compared to us people commenters uh, use your power in the way that you're not supposed to, that oppresses us, a minority. We are not a minority here, but to the world we are. But we may not know that because we're just in our small little area of Watsonville, uh, Pajaro, and every other section. 
So ethnic studies taught me that I'm really a minority and I'm challenged. And the fact that you're not here to support my teachers, support your students, support the next generation that wants to learn about themselves really saddens me. And I really wish you could come to a decision that would help us in having a good education and helping your students. Hi, good evening board. My name is Andrea Puente. I'm a junior at Guatemala High School and I don't think you guys should get rid of ethnic studies. I think it's the first class I will say I've had the funnest in and I think it's because of what we're learning and I think having the support of our teacher Mr. Pels makes it so much more engaging because he he helps us realize what's happening in the real world and I think if you guys come into one of our classes just one and you hear us talk and you hear the smiles and the conversations happening, you'll realize why keeping ethnic studies is so important. And sitting here in this room, I'm looking at your mission statement, and I think you need to really help prepare students. And this class is definitely preparing students for the real world, to go out and see what's happening and not be in a classroom unaware of what's happening in real world problems. Thank you. The next three speakers are Consuelo, Fabian, Lindsay Martinez, and Fernando Garcia. Good evening, board. Um, we are here to advocate for the district's partnership with Liter Liberated Ethnic Studies team and a revote for CRE contract. You claim the curriculum has been developed and teachers are already trained to teach in an attuned manner. However, our district has an extremely high turnover rate. Therefore, we must think about who is expected to train new teachers if those accredited teachers are not here to teach next year. We need our teachers to be trained by experts in the field of ethnic studies, regardless of whether they're teaching ethnic studies courses, particularly when 80% of our teachers are not BIPOC educators. Failing to adequately train teachers will impact their ability to teach in a culturally responsive way inviting teachers through this training to reflect on preconceived ideas they may subconsciously hold. This is called implicit bias, something we all have. Thank you, board. Another point you claim is that our school district doesn't have any money. However, it is vital to recognize that grant money will cover the cost of this curriculum. Therefore, the district will, ha will be at loss of no money. And your concerns are questionable since you already authorized the allocation of money for various programs like Soon to Grow that are not fulfilling the intended purpose. With this in mind, our school board should recognize that money isn't a barrier here. It is crucial that student input is taken into consideration. After all, the voices of students and staff are more reliable on what is happening in our schools. It is the responsibility of the school board to take student, parent, and staff input into consideration when making, go when making governing decisions or else this results in students developing a sense of hopelessness around influencing necessary changes in our school. We elected you to represent us. Don't forget that. Remember the community you serve. The next three speakers are Jessica Avalos Lado, Kimberly Aguirre, and Regina Ariza. Ariza. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jessica Avalos Lado, a senior at PV High, and my thoughts on the board refusing to vote on the CRE contract renewal is that it is plain and simple ignorance. How can you decide without even understanding the whole situation? The excuse that the contract would be too expensive is a lie. This, co this contract will be covered by a grant, so the $110,000 that would be a lot sounds like a distraction. CRE training leads to a positive increase in student engagement and understanding and encourages them to become people who could ask critical questions about everything around them. CRE is an important addition to any district and those serving a majority a majority BIPOC population because it helps all individuals address racial biases and thus classroom practices. A one-size-fits-all approach to education may not meet everyone's needs, which is what we have right now. You either fake it, perform adequately and fit in, or file into the school to prison pipeline. An understanding, informed and safe learning environment gives students space to grow. 
My groups and ethnic studies started a culinary club, which while we pursue culinary, okay, thank you. Creating a district-wide shift to foster individual cultural identity and simultaneously bridging the gap that the students in this district experience with the context content that they are taught is only possible through the active teachings of this curriculum and training by experts in their field like the Liberated Ethnic Studies team. By incorporating this curriculum, we nurture and empower students to embrace and celebrate their cultural identities from a young age, fostering a stronger sense of community and belonging once they reach high school. We must equip our youth with knowledge and tools to appreciate, respect, and celebrate this diversity. By introducing, by introducing this culturally responsive curriculum at an early stage, we can instill in students a sense of pride in their heritage and encourage them to embrace their unique cultural backgrounds of their peers. Once our, school, once our students are equipped with this knowledge, it will shape their experiences and interactions in high school. A strong sense of cultural identity will guide students to establish meaningful connections with their peers, create a supportive community, and contribute posit positively to the school environment. Thank you. Additionally, why are we seeking to censor facts that are known worldwide? Day by day, students are being informed about current events through social media platforms. Every time this happens, students are exposed to a biased point of view from news outlet that may not be reliable. Instead of letting our students be misinformed or duped into a biased algorithm, we should have access to proper instruction from our professionally trained teachers so we interact critically with the information we encounter. On that note, censorship is an act of oppression. The next three speakers are Alina Aguilar, Bella Martinez, and Valeria Cara. Or Lara, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Alina Aguilar. I am a first generation Latina who went to Watsonville High School and graduated from the University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm here to advocate for the renewal of the CRE program. Since 2016, I have been involved with the Pajaro Valley Historical Association like my colleague here, Bill Beecher. I did not have an ethnic studies course like the younger generations that came after me. Learning about one's ethnic background, history, and identity is no longer a right, but a privilege. Since people in power like the board get to decide who get their stories told. History connects people in the present and in the past. It allows us to have empathy so that we can look at people of color whose stories are not focused on and say, your history matters. You deserve to be remembered. What you are showing the students today by ignoring their pleas is that you do not care about them or their right to learn about ethnic history. That the historic credit due to the indigenous, black, Asian, Latin American, and more does not matter. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bella Meki Martinez. I'm ASB president at Watsonville High and president of our Asian American Pacific Islander Student Union at Watsonville High. And as a Japanese and Mexican person myself, learning about history and impacted intersectional communities is extremely important. And the classes that I've taken in ethnic studies have been severely impactful. I've also been involved in the Filipino American history curriculum creation in partnership with UCSE. And seeing the care and intention that goes into the planning and the creation of the curriculum by me, my teachers, peers, and professors is so important and it cannot be ignored. So seeing that go to waste would be really sad. And as a senior going through the application process to attend predominantly white institutions and colleges that were not made for us, not made for students of color, is hard. And I'm not the first and not the last student of color to aspire to achieve a higher degree. And knowing my history and others' history of impacted communities and a diverse and inclusive history is important to all future generations to strengthen. Yeah, thank you. I'm a senior at Pajaro Valley High School, and I want to say that ethnic studies is essential for students as it offers a comprehensive understanding of diverse culture, histories, and perspective. By including ethnic studies in school curricula, we foster empathy, critical thinking, and cultural competence among students. It helps create a more inclusive and, and tolerant society by challenging stereotypes and promoting social justice. Keeping ethnic studies in schools provides students with the opportunity to learn about their own heritage and the heritage of others, pr promoting a sense of belonging and appreciation for diversity. It also equips students with the tools to navigate the increasingly multi multicultural world, preparing them for success in globalized society. Personally, ethnic studies has been invaluable 
to me in my understanding of different cultures and histories it has challenged my assumptions and biases allowing me to approach the world with a more open mind and empathetic perspective it has also empowered me to advocate for social justice and equal equally equality in my community overall i believe ethnic studies is not just imp important but necessary for fostering a more inclusive and equitable society thank you thank, thank you, you. The next, three, the next three speakers are uh, Dianita Vermontes, Daniel Sanchez, and Emma Fatham, Fatham, student at PV. Good evening. My name is Dianita Vermontes, and I'm a senior at Power Valley High School. And I want to emphasize what many before me have been stating. I wish to express my deep concern for the adamant refusal of the CRE contract that many arguments have stated that um, Many arguments fail to recognize and consider the narratives and wisdom from underrepresented people and groups that may be missing from textbooks, from art, from history, from science, from foreign language. I also want to include that the school board has been inconsiderate to the needs of teachers and students. The, the board has failed to uphold their mission statement and has failed their communities. Thank you. Hello trustees, my name is Emma and I am a student at PV High. I wonder what the responsibilities of school board actually were. So I went to the California School Board Association or CSBA website and found a few things. First, the role of trustees who sit on locally elected school boards is to ensure that school districts are responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of their communities. Meanwhile, many members of this board are allowing their own biases to override, override the larger school community's beliefs. Their partnership with the Liberated Ethnic Studies team help to develop courses and curriculums that prioritize the success and empowerment of students over the past two years. Members of the district, teachers, students, parents, and members of the community have all advocated for the third year renewal of the CRE contract. Second, the board's responsibilities include both making decisions and providing resources that support mutually agreed upon priorities and goals, and upholding district policies that have been approved by the board. I'll remind you, the PFUSD Board of Trustees on Wednesday the 28th of October 2020 unanimously approved a plan to add ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. This makes the development of enough ethnic studies courses to allow every student in a school to meet the graduation requirement and mutually agreed upon priority and goal. Now you're failing to support the training of additional teachers and our admin, which impacts the development of new ethnic studies courses and curriculum, which fails to allow students That's the opportunities to access the graduation requirement. That's and one minute. Thank you. Uh, as everyone already stated what I was going to say, I'm going to move on to the next topic that on hand that I wanted to talk about was about the Pajaro Valley system and how it's the lack of like allocation of resources. Like we, we lack a pool, we lack various courses that like other schools have like Watsonville and Aptos. PV doesn't have those courses like other AP classes like Watsonville and PV have like, tw no Watsonville and Aptos has like 20 while PV only has like seven AP courses. And I wanted to um, advocate for, uh, for my school and for my community since we live nearby and we also suffer from like the same um, financial barriers and we want to proceed um, higher education but we can't due to limited resources. So I wanted to appoint that we get like better teachers, more classes and also maybe a theater. The next three speakers are Bernie Gomez, Chris Webb, and Alexandra Lopez. Uh, buenas tardes, uh, good evening board. Um, keep it simple, bring back CRE for discussion. After your discussion, approve it. It's that simple. You got one year. That's it. You know, administrate. I believe I heard it was an administrative support for administrators, right? Um, stop perpetuating your um, white structures of or white dynamics, power dynamics, right, of power and control. You know, I get it, Serpa, Acosta, you know, um, but what I see is that you're being anti-people of color, right? 
you're be, you're actually perpetuating <coughs> racist ideology. You know, as someone that's running to be on a higher place of government, it kind of, you know, just it, it it scares me, right? That you're gonna be in that position potentially. You know, bring back CRE. Just stop. Yeah, just stop it. You know? Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Alexandra Lopez, and I'm currently a senior at Pajaro Valley High School, graduate of 2024. As of right now, members of your agenda setting committee currently align with individuals who have no children in this district who believe that our ethnic studies program, which was supported by the Liberated Ethnic Studies Group, is potentially teaching its students how to negatively view or exclude certain culture groups. I have been in this class for three years, and although I will be graduating pretty soon, I would like for all future students to have this same opportunity and take part in this experience as I did. Now, I've heard about the concerns expressed by community members that because of Dr. Allison, our existing cur curriculum may have bias and been anti-Semitic. However, I think the board and these community members are unaware of the fact that in our 10th grade world history classes, our curriculum includes standards 10.8, where students analyze the cause and consequences of World War II, including the Holocaust, as well as standards 10.9, which requires we understand how the factors of nationalism developed in the Middle East, how the Holocaust affected world opinion, regarding the need of a Jewish state and the significant effects of local and establishment of Israel and world affairs. There is a fear of bias and single lens being applied to our curriculum, but we are receiving a well-rounded education and between our history and ethnic studies courses, we access multiple so, perspectives while minute. being empowered to develop our opinions using our critical thinking skills. Thank you. Good evening. Um, at this point, I feel like anyone who is speaking against the CRE contract and, and the board itself should, if they're, if they're committed to that, they should bring some evidence. Um, as a teacher, that's what I would want to see. Um, it, it's been a little while now. It shouldn't take, if it's really that bad, like we should have been able to come up with some kind of damning document where we'd be like, well, here, community, shut up, right here it is. It's been a while. So, um, I, I, at this point, it almost feels defamatory to continue to say things about this organization and the people in it and not have the, the evidence. Also, I think it's really important to renew the contract because we, we do need the admin trained. We need all the, for everyone, even the teachers still again, and then other levels of management because if we're not on the same page, then teachers could get reprimanded or subject to hostile work environments just for doing their job when they're just following their district training. So we really need that, and this is long overdue to be on the agenda at the very minimum. It should be renewed, of course, but at least put on the agenda. Thank you. The next three speakers are America Lopez, Bobby Pels, and Ayana Viegas, student at Watsonville High School. It is frustrating that a board that is made up of white majority can decide the education of so many students of color. In my ethnic studies class, we have learned about four types of oppression, ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. When you guys refuse to bring back a curriculum that teaches people of color their history, it is a denial of their culture, of their person, and therefore a form of institutional oppression, one that we have seen repeated throughout history many times before. So I must ask you, how does it feel like to wield a weapon that has killed so many people just because of their color? The best part about history is that you can learn from it. It is a shame that you guys have not had that opportunity yet. So I invite you tonight to look back and learn, because when you look forward, you will see that, that your denial of our history will not stop us from being heard. The very opposite, it empowers our voices. Support PVSD students and bring back CRE. Uh, good evening, Bobby Pell, Watsonville High. I'm here once again to speak on the CRE contract. Six months ago, six months ago, when I first spoke on this issue, I pointed out that it was our, collect our collective responsibility to ensure that we provide the best educational experiences for our children. And I'm grateful that tonight the community has come out to collectively hold you to that responsibility. Although I can't help but notice when the kids show up, you start cutting us off at one minute. Yeah. I'm most I am most grateful to my students. When they wrote to you on their own behalf, I applauded their courage in standing up to protect the education they feel that they deserve. I hope they know that I am beyond proud of them. Although I thought that surely you would be too. 
that you would listen to these people that you have been elected to serve. But so far, they've been ignored. So tonight, we are all here together in solidarity to tell you that we will not be ignored. Yeah. Support ethnic studies. Bring back CRE. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Ayanna. I am a senior at Watsonville High School and I am here to support renewing the Community Responsive Education contract. Um, and I would like to begin with stating not renewing this contract will have a huge negative impact on not only our future, future ethnic studies classes, but our future ethnic studies teacher and current ones. Our overall department will also suffer. Um, as this contract provides our teachers with training resources and provides us with um, a successful ethnic studies course. We need this. I have been taking ethnic literature studies for three years um, and have been awarded student of the year for one of those. And I can say with confidence, I haven't seen a single case of anti-Semitism throughout those three years. In fact, we are taught to value and respect other cultures and ethnicities, not just our own. We also have yet to see a more impactful and positive class in all my years of schooling. I really do love this class. This is also in part to CRE, but as it affects us and our teachers. Shouldn't we have a say in this? Yeah. The next three speakers are Elias Gonzalez, Jasmine Cornejo, and Austin Martin Watsalo High School. Um, buenas noches, good evening board. Uh, full name is Elias Gonzalez. I sit in Olivia Flores' district. It's unfortunate she's not here today, but I understand things come up, right? Uh, first of all, I just want to stand here today and acknowledge the whole community, right? Um, these are young people that are standing in your district, right? Um, their parents, their family members, their teachers. This is what we're trying to do. I think I heard the term brought up by one of our little brothers over there, institutional oppression. I think this is what we're trying to avoid here. Right, we don't want to organize the next generations, right? We're scared of organizing this next generation because the old generation, I'm not calling you old, I probably in that old generation too, right? <laughs> uh, but we're too scared of that. We actually need to motivate them, we need to set them up. Look at the community. I mean, this is what we need. We don't need to be told what we don't need, but this is what Watsonville needs now. We need you all to be leaders. We all need you to bring that contract back to the space. We need to talk about it. Let's teach our community to have conversations. Let's include all of us. Let's have a dialogue about this. Let's have an entendimiento to figure this out collectively. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Um, good evening. I'm Jasmine Cornejo, a senior at Watsonville High, and I'm here to talk about the renewal of the CRE contract. As a student, the only time I've ever felt proud of my background and my culture was once I began learning ethnic studies. This class has been the only one to speak to me and have me interested in learning. We learn about institutional oppression and how the system is set up that may not always be in our best interest, but that we can still succeed if we play our cards right. It gives us hope to escape our stereotypes and not fall into the cycle that everyone tries to keep us in. I have been in ethnic studies for three years and have never learned anything anti-Semitic. What I have learned is about the real history that isn't taught in history class. If these topics are not discussed, people will continue to live their lives ignorantly without realizing that some ideas in their head could be harmful to others and contributing to inequality or hate upon a certain group. What ethnic studies teaches is that we all deserve to be equal, but in this system to be equal, you may have to fight for what is right. The curriculum is essential for a balanced education and something that will carry on with people for their whole lives beyond high school. If any money should be spent, it should be on the education of the next generation, including providing the proper training for our teachers who teach this subject. Thank you. Hello, I'm Austin Martin, and I'm here to speak again on the CRE program in support of the renewing the contract. I am still confused on to why we are being ignored with no one asking us what we want to do. We are the community. We are the ones in the schools. We are the ones being affected by a CRE program. We are the ones in the classroom actually learning about ethnic studies. We are the ones who will be affected by the lack of CRE. We are all in support of it here. We have over 50 students here in support with teachers and parents too, and still rather take the side of two people opinions on the program, it's over us. Many of our teachers and classmates have spent our time to gather as many people here in the community to support the CRE program and come out to the board meeting 
so you can no longer ignore us. I'll restate that as a student of genetic studies, I've never seen an instance of anti-Semitism or bigotry in my three years of taking this class. And I would try, I'd like to personally talk to Trustee DeSerpa of any anti-Semitic comments given to you, I apologize for, but that was not us. That's not the CRA program. We do not, that's not the SX program. We do not do that. We do not promote that. That's all against our policy. That's all against us. We do not support any of those pro uh, comments made. I like to end my statement with asking you to please bring back the CRE program. Thank you. All right, the next three speakers are Alexis McNabb, Isabella Leon, and Sofia Gomez. Hello and greetings, Board of Trustees. My name is Sophie and I attend Pajaro Valley High School. It's come to my attention that the board before me is refusing to renew or support the CRE contract, an incredibly beneficial contract out of fear. Fear of resistance, fear of dismantlement, and fear of change. This change is good. We need more ethnic studies classes. We need more teacher training. We need more options for students to meet the graduation requirement. We need our students more aware of our nation's potential as well as its issues and flaws. Our school community needs ethnic studies. We are your future. We deserve knowledge, safety, comfort, and support from as many teachers as possible. We also deserve educators who are provided expert training by leaders within their district. Um, I'm sorry, I'm messing up. People who the district already has a two-year relationship with. My class is important to me. I've learned so many things about myself, my community, and the world I live in in this class alone. And I plan to stick around for all four years of high school eager to learn more. Did you hear that? A student is eager. There's one thing in my ethnic studies class that's taught me that sticks out the most, and that's that every voice matters. Each and every one of here, as active one, members of our community, minute. has a voice that matters. A voice that deserves to be heard, considered, and not pushed into a corner, disregarded, or forgotten, because we're oh. young and you have power to ignore us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Isabella Leon, and I'm a student at Pajaro Valley High School. As an Afro-Latina student, I've enjoyed experience, I've experienced so much racism in this school district, from students, and to my teachers, and to even the district here. I've never felt so neglected by a school board in my entire life, and you not renewing this contract is detrimental to students who look like me and to, and to students who with other ethnic backgrounds. <laughs> I've never felt safe in my school once in my life. You, it's constantly saying the N-word, constant microaggression. And for once in my life, I felt safe in an ethnic studies class. I felt heard, I felt seen for once in my life. And the fact that you're not even considering that this is not just for students, but for teachers, this is for students too. For students who look like me, who students who, all these students here, who are trying their best and who are learning so much from this program, yet you're denying us the right to learn. You are elected officials, act like it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alexis McNabb, and I'm here actually to read a statement by Watsonville High School student Mariana, who could not be here, but their voice is important. So I'm here to read what Mariana wrote, which is, the board should big bring back the CRE contract and have it stay permanently. I have been taking the ethnic studies course for the past three years now, and I can say that I absolutely love that class. I not only stay informed with what's happening around the world now, but learn that people have faced oppression since the beginning of time. Removing this contract is like taking the first step in pretending that this unfairness never existed. We need to know what happened in our history in order to change our future. Ethnic studies is a class where everyone should be able to take. What we learn in there are things that we actually use and need in life. I learned that as a minority, I have to work twice as hard to succeed, but even then can still be looked down on because of these ideals around us. Taking an ethnic studies class made me want to beat this stereotype. Some families may think that taking this class is harmful to a student's mind, but they're wrong. Instead, this class will motivate and encourage you to do better because minorities can do it too. You get to learn about the four eyes of oppression, what components make up your identity, white privilege, color blindness, and so much more. One minute. Being a part of an ethnic studies class means that your voice will be heard and you get to express yourself and learn about the challenges you may never knew existed. Thank you. All right, the next three speakers are Sandino Gomez, Nat Lowe, and Ellie Davies.
Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Shackman. My name is Nat Lowe, District 7. I'm here for the sixth time. I've said pretty much all that I have to say in the last five board meetings, so I'm, I'm gonna read you this, these expert, excerpts of this letter that was written by 62 Jewish community members that they sent to you this week. Um, if you didn't read your emails, I brought you copies. So from their letter, I quote, we are, we are writing as a coalition of Jewish constituents. We stand in strong support for the renewal of the CRE contract in support of keeping the highly successful and impactful ethnic studies curricula at PVUSD. We echo the overwhelming support from constituents that has been articulated in meetings and letters. As Jews, we want to challenge the accusations of anti-Semitism that led to the suspension of the initial contract. In addition, we strongly affirm the importance of ethnic studies in putting histories of diverse experiences in conversation. We deepen our knowledge and arrive at more compassionate understandings of each other. In fact, Jewish ed values of education demand this of us. Continued, we are asking for our histories of Jewish oppression to be taught in tandem with other histories of persecution, including that of the Palestinian people. Acknowledging this injustice doesn't erase Jewish history or anti-Jewish oppression or our real concerns about Jewish safety in a world with rising anti-Semitism. This letter states, our Jewish path to healing and to safety has to be a path of compassion for and listening to others' stories, in addition to sharing our own stories and being heard. We object to false allegations that teaching the accurate history about the Israeli occupation of Palestine is anti-Semitic. Perpetuating this myth makes genuine anti-Semitism much more difficult to identify and confront. The history of what has taken place in Palestine for the better part of the last century, in line with all histories of oppression, must be taught and intended to in a K-12 curriculum. End quote. The authors of the letter regret not being able to attend this meeting, but they are planning to be here at the next meeting to speak to you themselves. Thank you. Signed by 62 local Jewish community members. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us, even if you did cut our time. I'm a proud former member of the Watsonville Brown Berets, and I'm so proud of PVUSD that you have moved forward with ethnic studies curriculum in such an innovative and like groundbreaking way. Our history classes, our art classes, and our English classes are clearly working. Listen to our students, please. I've benefited personally. I took two years of the CRE training. In those two years, I never heard anything anti-Semitic from Allison or any of the other trainers involved in that training. And you can ask every teacher that took that training. In the three years I've been teaching ethnic studies, I have never shared any anti-Semitic content and I never will. I teach liberation in my classroom for all people everywhere. I teach celebrating our diversity and, and, and looking at, at, at people as equals. Uh, CRE taught us how to teach ethnic studies. They did not teach us what to teach. They never handed us lessons. They never handed us curriculum. They taught us ideas behind ethnic studies so we could be more effective ethnic studies teacher. We are encouraged to teach local history and to celebrate the diverse community of PRV. CRE taught us to do this. So and I'm proud minute. of PVSD and what y'all have done. Please finish the job by hiring CRE back so we can be better educators. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Victor Moreno, Takashi Mizuno, uh, la last name Ornelas, student, Pajaro Valley High School. R Rivero, Rivera, Ornelas, student. Hi, I'm Victor Moreno. I, I'm a senior in, in Pajaro High School, and I want to say, why don't we have this, like, the same opportunities as like other high schools? They have French, they have pools, they have theaters. But our school, we just have a football field. That's it. I'm like, because nice. I want to be a drama kid, but I don't have a good proper theater room at all. We have like this size here, and it's nothing for me. I need like a big stage, because honestly, <laughs> I want to be open, you know? And our school doesn't have that. But why does Watu and Aptos have that, but not us? Yeah? 
I'm sorry, I got, I got, nine, I got eight, seven seconds. Uh, anyways, um, I want to say, why can't we have like French in our in our schools? Because honestly, I'm going, I'm going to Europe in 17 days, and I do not know French. I want, I want to learn new, new languages, new cultures, but our school is just Spanish. Like, can we have options to choose what language we want to use? Say. One minute. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, good evening. Oh, my name is Takashi, and this is my fifth time to say public comments on the same issue. And today I was with American Indians and uh, our native Hawaiian and Guatemalan American at uh, Indian Canyon in Horista. And we had a great time there. And it reminded me that we are the guests on the land of Indian Canyon in Horista. And we are here in Wassonville area, Parvare. How many of us know the name of the village, Indian village here? How many of us know that? The name of the Indian village is, is Tiubuta. Tiubuta. And we are the guests on the land of the people of the village. To, to Buddha. They were forcibly taken to the Mission San Carlos at Carmel by the Sea near Monterey. That's one, well, that was one minute. Okay, I, I, I'll continue next time. <laughs> <laughs> My name is River Ornelas. Our ethnic studies program will be severely impacted by the CRE contract not being renewed and more so by it not being on the agenda. The curriculum taught at our schools doesn't focus on the myriad of oppressive systems present in our society or the experiences of countless underrepresented individuals. Ethnic studies was created for the sole purpose to teach about the non-dominant narrative and educate about the systems of oppression our day-to-day about our day-to-day -day life studies, and more importantly, the SRE contract allows people, specifically teachers and administration, to address their own personal privilege and biases. Without proper education and training, how are we supposed to properly learn? I am aware that you are concerned about the cost of the training within the CRE. However, we have a grant which would make the training completely free. In addition, I am aware that you were scared of biases and own personal um, own personal politics being involved in the curriculum. However, DeSerpa, why is yours involved? Also, look at your voters. The next three speakers are Angel Alcantar, Eli Romero, and Marlene Vega. Good evening, my name is Eli Romero Ortigosa, and I took studies, ethnic studies two years ago, and when I was in that class, I learned about my history. I learned how to regain my power that was stolen and have been, has been oppressed since many years. And I want that the same thing for my brothers, for the younger generation, I wanted to learn they have the power to thrive in this system where we often oppress. I wanted to like know they can thrive out there as whatever they want, not just because this, uh, this is frustrating. Uh, and then, yeah, we need endless studies, not just for like people who are being oppressed, but for everyone to learn how to embrace diversity. Yeah. We we'll learn about ourselves, but also about others to appreciate each other, to learn how to like communicate, to learn how to thrive in a society where often we find ourselves very individualistic. So we need to come as a community like we did tonight to like fight for what is right for us and to stop being oppressed. We are tired of being oppressed and we are gonna regain our power back however it takes us to like get it back. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angel Alcantara and I am a senior uh, attending uh, Pajaro Valley High School. And I just wanna say what is something that we don't, uh, what, what don't we have that uh, Watsonville High School, uh, Watsonville High School has, and Aptos has, that we don't have. 
because we don't have the same facilities they do. We don't have a pool, we don't have a theater, and there was plans for that when our school was built. Uh, no, when there was plans to build our school, and it took us so long just to get a football field and a track. How many years did we wait for that? And there was also talks about building a bridge to go to and from our school for pedestrians and for bikes to go through, and they were giving, uh, they were, that was given 11.7, million dollars and where are the plans for that uh, what's the process on that what are we um, what's the progress on that when is that going to get started did that get passed through uh, are we going to get feedback for that and the same thing for theater and our pool I think uh, everybody every school uh, there should be like swimming lessons you know I think everybody should learn, should learn how to swim I think everybody should know that and four previous high school alumni from our school have died because they drowned. And I think if we had a pool and we guys uh, if we gave swimming lessons, that could have been prevented. Unlike Wattsville, they have swimming school. I mean, uh, they have a swimming pool Let's, and they get taught six weeks minute. of swimming. Thank so, you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Marlene Vega and I am a senior at Pajaro Valley High School. Um, I think homework should be reduced because homework gives students a lot of pressure and a lot of stress when we are at home. It also gives teachers more stress for grading and coming up with assignments for the students to do. We don't know what's going on in each other's lives and it, not everyone has time to do work when they get home. Class assignments should be enough to give a student a grade. When we are at home, I'm sure everyone would want to spend their time as they like with their personal life and not need to worry about school. Extra homework should be an option for students if to get if they need extra work to bring up their grades. Thank you. The next three speakers are Itzel, Maximiliano, and Dr. Parosa. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My, re my representative is Trustee Flores, who unfortunately could not make it, and I am from Area 5. I am appalled that this issue is not on the agenda yet, even after so much effort from the community to make it so. Time and time again, teachers, parents, students have shown up, and you ignore us. You deny students the right to an education that reflects their lived experience. You take away teachers' access to informed training. You deny district admin the opportunity to receive valuable training and you remain silent on why. To trustees Flores, De Serpa, and Acosta, your inaction brings doubt to where your loyalties lie. Are you loyal to us, your constituents, or Actions speak louder than words. And the message you are spreading is that you do not prioritize adequately informing your constituents. We will not let you so disgracefully ignore us. We will keep growing in numbers, and we will not stop until you actually serve your public, acknowledge your bias, and add the CRE contract back to the agenda. Just and I'll minute. close with the statement to Trustee Soto. As the voice of the people and a decisive vote amongst the board, That's, uh, you one, should recognize that you are not doing your job. Stop avoiding us and listen to the people. Bring back CRE. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ishel. I am an eighth grader and this is my fourth time asking you why you haven't done anything to address the discontinuation of the CRE contract. You have yet to provide evidence for your accusations. You see that our group is growing and you choose to ignore us as if we're going to stop. Us students are here on school nights asking you to bring back CRE, which should be a clue of how much we want this contract back. How are you helping the students? How are you listening to the community? I am here and I have testing tomorrow. This is how much ethnic studies matters to me. You are discouraging people, especially students, from being involved in the community. Multiple students have expressed wanting to speak at board meetings, but they see you ignoring us. How are you encouraging, speak, uh, how are you encouraging kids to speak if this is how you treat them? I am extremely disappointed, and I hope next time you represent your community that, uh, who elected you and put this back on the agenda. Thank you.
I am Dr. Barraza, and I am very disappointed that uh, that uh, Trustee Soto is not here because in on his campaign site he says I will be your voice and fight for you. Wh why is he not fighting for us? How is he not, how is he listening to to our voices if he won't return messages, if he won't return emails, and then when somebody finally reaches out to him, he says respect me. Well, he lost that respect because he's not representing us anymore. And you know what? Trustee DeSerpa, back to you again. I am so glad that Nat brought that letter to you because you consistently keep lying and saying that every Jewish group is against CRE. That's evidence that it's not. Where is your evidence that every Jewish group does that, that, that is against it? You have yet to, to give me any evidence. I asked you weeks ago, give me evidence that supports your point. You have yet to give me anything, but yet you continue to lie to the public and say every, every Jewish group is against this. Lies right there. Also, in case you didn't know, one of the biggest groups, Jewish Voices, uh, Jewish Voices for Peace, a national uh, group, supports CRE. So I think you need to check your facts before you go around lying and saying that it's every group. And just for all of you who weren't here, the gentleman who was here and said he disagreed, that was the person who started this. It was that person and one the, more. Two people is what caused the, this. The, the, Two people. The, the one minute. Are being ignored. And one last thing, I'm going to check to see if you guys are actually following your rules about giving us one minute, because if that's a violation, we're going to report it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the next three speakers is Maralda, Tony Tapiz, and Gabriel Barraza. Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Tony Tapiz. I'm a parent and uh, also a founding member of Watsonville in the Heart. I want to start, start off by saying I love my community. I love the school district. Whenever I've been called upon to help, I've been there. For eight years, I sat on the special needs committee. Didn't see a lot of board members go in there. To her credit, I did see Kim there. I also have been a site council president for Diamond Tech. And uh, as ma many of you remember, my son uh, had the first service dog to uh, come into use in the district. And what's going to happen if we don't have ethnic studies? For me, I have my grandma. I went and saw this picture at her house. It's from 1935, Pajaro School. And I said, Grandma, how come you're not smiling? And she said, probably because they had just beaten me for speaking Spanish. Who knows that? You know, seven, or four of these kids disappeared one day. I found minute. out that was because they were taken to internment camps. And that happened here in Pajaro. Who knows that? Yeah. Who, how many of you guys know that? That's it, it, it didn't happen at somewhere else. It happened here. And these kids need to know that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gabriel Barraza. I live in Area 5. I had a speech prepared, but you guys took our time away. So I'm going to say this. Anti-Semitism is real. And it is an increase. And it is horrible when any group is targeted. But the way that Mr. Stein represents that is not in the service of the Jewish community. It's in the service of conservative power. People can be oppressed and oppressors at the same time. And when you use words like anti-Semitism as a cudgel to stop other marginalized groups from learning about their history, and you can intimidate a school board or maybe align with their own principles, Ms. Acosta, that's disgraceful. That is disgraceful, and you guys are allowing it to happen by not putting CRE back on the agenda and allowing us to have a discussion about it. Thank you. I wish it, I could say the uh, good evening, but sadly it hasn't. Many students, teachers, and community members have come up here, but I feel like you have failed to listen to us. Time and time again, we have come here together to show the importance of the CRE contract. 
You guys claim that it's too expensive, but it's covered by a grant. Many other points have been made by my classmates, and it is, sa it is sad that we are being ignored. But please know that we will not let we will not let you guys stop us. We will continue to fight for what we believe in, and we believe with teaming up in the CRE contract. So please stop putting your politi political agendas ahead of your constituents. Please listen to us, because what we have to say is important. Thank you. The next three speakers are Maria Perez, Sean Henry, and M Marilyn. Hi, my name is Maria Perez. I'm a PB high school graduate. And at UC Berkeley, I realized that our schools here don't have all the same programs like many other schools around the state do. Uh, yet, here we are again fighting to keep one of another program. So please look at how many of our youth care about this. Bring, please bring this item back to the agenda and please consider all the efforts teachers, parents, and youth uh, of the youth showing up today because it takes a lot. Ethnic studies allows us to think critically, do this for our youth and future students. We need this commitment from you and please renew that CRE contract. Thank you. Hello, Sean Henry, a school psychologist at Watsonville High School, and I just want to start off by saying I'm tremendously proud of all these young people and the speakers, and, um, and our future is bright with these, with these leaders. Um, the proof is in the pudding is an expression that means the value, quality, or truth of something must be judged based on its direct experience with it or with its results. You have a lot of people here that know the pudding. We're actually on the same page. I want to dap you up. <laughs> he brought up Willie's name because he said Willie would support this. So the most important thing is sometimes when you're stuck, you now have, you're going to be announcing a, a superintendent. Do the new superintendent a favor and rethink and give an option to basically go on the record or do something like hold a town hall meeting, a special board meeting, or something. But you have to go on the record and explain. There needs to be dialogue about why someone is against this, and it needs to be heard because all the voice is saying the poof is in the pudding. First of all, I want to applaud the students. Uh, stand up, speak out, stand up for justice, stand up for help. Don't be quiet, keep doing it until we get what is needed and what is just. I am very thrilled that you're all here and very sickened by this district in your uh, type of response and um, I think most people aren't anti-semitic but they're anti-genocide anti-colonial settler state anti-apartheid that's what people are talking about and for you to sit on your computer all the time and not pay attention is in my book very disrespectful um, I taught for 20 years in this district, and it does say two minutes to speak. And I think this is illegal, and it shows how you don't want to hear the students. It's outrageous. I taught at a MST in Calabasas. The, the, the president said and so, one minute, and so that's 2000, one minute. And I am so disturbed at Ms. all Garrett, the that is radiation your time. exposure. Ms. Garrett, your time is up. It is one minute. Cell phones, et cetera, that is in Ms. Garrett, you students. your time is and up, Ms. Garrett. Your time is up. Time, you are over a minute. Hear, your time is up. Your time, your time, time is, up. is up. How about the time being up for Wi-Fi and cell phone your time is up. harming students? and replace it with wired safe technology. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Garrett, for being here.
So I, I have a card right here. I'm not sure someone crossed off their name. Carlos Rivera? Okay. Oh, uh, hold on. oh and behind him is Hilda and Marta Bolaich. Well, I had a speech as well, but you cut our time. Thank you very much for that. But my name is Este Carlos Rivera Seves. I'm a P, uh, este PV student. I've been este, I've been really, really been interested in history for a very long time. But the simple fact that I can learn my own history, my culture, that I, w I wasn't born in Mexico. I was born here in California. I was actually the very first este Christmas baby in the Watsonville Community Hospital. But the simple fact that you all decided, or three of you specifically, one not even here, you all, this, those three decided to say, no, we do not need that contract anymore. And specifically you, Miss Kim, you keep looking at your computer, why? What is so important in your computer that you cannot listen to all these students, these, these parents, and all these teachers, huh? Why can't you listen to us? Why did you also remove, you, Georgia, why did you remove one minute from us? We want to talk. We can continue this conversation for hours and hours. Why this contract needs to be renewed? But instead, you decided to take minutes, a minute, a precious minute from us. Continue this, and you guys might not even, este, you might not have our support anymore. Continue. Good evening. This is Hilda Gazanferi. During the two years that we've been in ethnic studies classes, including world history, we've learned to challenge and evolve our perspectives, increase our understanding of cultural and historical impacts on different aspects of society, and how different elements of our identity can empower us and help us come together to improve the society as a whole. In order to develop these understandings, we need to be exposed to opportunities to think deeply and critically about ourselves and all groups who are affected by the exploitive system within the society. As a piano teacher and a career college math tutor, I know it's very hard to teach a subject that you have not fully mastered, as it will lead to misunderstanding of the curriculum and even failing to properly educate the youth. Today, we are asking to put the CRA contract back on the agenda so the board can vote again and hopefully bring back this essential partnership. Remember, without training and knowledge of the curriculum, it's almost impossible to teach. Our teachers, in order to not confuse us, not give us misinformation and appropriately support us, need education just as we do. It's interesting to us that ethnic studies is a graduation requirement. But we pose the question, what about you? Have you gone through any cultural responsive education? Like for instance, the one offered at teachers and experiences across the district? The good news is it's free. Because of a grant secured by the district that is still available. Perhaps if you took this one training, minute. you might can reconsider your position that this training leads to division and potentially in even anti-Semitism. We hope to see you soon in one of our ethnic studies classes. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Marta Balaich. Saba Charter School commingles its school bus operations with operations of Golden Brands beer distribution property. For years, Golden Brands has been expanding its business on an undersized industrial lot, causing its trucking operations to spill over onto Highway 129, resulting in moving violations that put the community at risk. Golden Brands property has one driveway that prohibits trucks and another that is shared with Saba. The shared driveway is substandard for Saba's related traffic. The driveways are under the jurisdiction of Caltrans. Despite the dangers of these driveway encroachments, it appears that neither the city of Watsonville, Golden Brands, nor Saba ever contacted Caltrans regarding the expanded and changed use of these driveways. And students are routinely exposed to vivid alcohol ads. Rand Corporation research on the impact of minority youth exposure to alcohol advertising is relevant as these ads increase the likelihood that adolescents will start to drink alcohol. I urge you to intervene and require SABA to use a safer bus protocol. Thank you. Is that all of our speakers for this evening? Yes. Thank you. I will now move us to item 8.1, um, or items 8 uh, for employee organization comments. Now is the time that we hear from our employee organizations. We will start with 8.1, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, PVFT. Good evening, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman. Um, just before everybody leaves, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Props to all of you. That was incredible. 
Um, I am wondering if the board really truly understands what culturally and community responsive education is. After all of the public comments devoted to this topic, not just tonight, but over months and months of time, I just can't help but wonder if there aren't cer certain personal issues that are clouding judgment on the topic. Not only do our treat teachers and quite obviously our students want this training, we need administrators to be trained as well. They are the leaders of our school sites and they must uphold the professional standards of their staff as well as their own professional standards. One of which is advocating, nurturing, and sustaining a school culture and instructional program conducive to stu student learning and staff professional growth. Since you are unable, it seems, to hear the words of the community and your constituents, I'm gonna share some words that you all have approved yourselves. These are some promises that you as trustees have made through various resolutions over the time. I don't have time to read all of them, so I'm just gonna highlight a few that share what CRE education looks like. In your resolution on Women's History Month, you stated Pajaro Valley Unified School District and its partners invest in the empowerment of our young women through everyday lesson plans, as well as programs such as ethnic studies, girls in engineering, and girls who code, among others. In your resolution for raising the pride flag, you wrote to inspire equity, create alliances, celebrate diversity, and establish a safe environment in our schools and community. In your resolution for Latinx E Heritage Month, you wrote that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District continues to partner with our community for events and to provide activities in the classroom where students talk about their identity, their culture, and to continue the historical traditions that have been part of our community. In your resolution on Native American Heritage Month, it wrote, recognizes the importance in the education and celebration of Native North American culture with appropriate and accurate programs and activities to honor the rich history and culture of the Native North Americans. In the resolution for Black History Month, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes that current research supports the positive effect of ethnic studies courses and other culturally relevant approaches to engage and motivate higher academic performance of all students. That is not the community's words. These are resolutions that you yourselves have passed. So I ask you to, to really look at why this is an issue and why this cannot be brought back before the board. I want to congratulate our CSEA brothers and sisters for ratifying their TA and closing negotiations. Um, it is a big deal to close negotiations, as I very well know. Um, on tonight's agenda, though, you are also being asked to approve raises for administration, management, as well as cabinet. Administrators are on the front lines with our students, and we are fully in support of the increases to their compensation along with management. However, I just wonder about the optics the board is presenting tonight when just a few weeks after a presentation on declining enrollment and the fiscal solvency of this district, you are now looking at providing a raise to our cabinet level employees, the highest paid employees in our district. It states in the second interim that these increases are in alignment with PVFT and CSEA raises. However, I would like to point out that our lowest paid members our adult educators and early childhood educators only received a 3% increase, not a 5% increase. We know that there are difficult decisions that are gonna be need to be made in the coming years, but with our interim superintendent, an interim assistant superintendent of HR, no current CBO that I'm aware of, I just ask, is this the best time to make that vote? Thank you. Thank you, PBF team. Thank you, Roddy. Um, now moving to item 8.2, California School Employees Association. Do we have anyone here this evening from CSEA? Seeing none, I will move to item 8.3, the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers, PAVAM. Good evening, President Acosta, 
Board of Trustees and Interim Superintendent, Mr. Checkman. I'm Peggy Pugh, the Executive Director for Teaching and Learning, and I'm proud to be here tonight with my colleague, Rich Moran, as we speak um, to tell you a little bit about what we've been working on um, as the managers in PVUSD. We are on the move. We are busy folks. And just a couple events to highlight to show how our Pavan members are working hard in support of our students, our families, and our staff. So this coming Saturday, right in this very boardroom, we will be here along with colleagues, um, site administrators, district level administrators, and we will be encouraging um, all of our community members to come on down. We're recruiting for teaching positions, lots of classified positions. Um, so we're proud to do that work because we're proud of the work that we do in PVUSD. We believe very strongly in the assets that our families and students bring and share with us every single day, and we want everyone in our local area to have the opportunity to work here in PVUSD right alongside us. Same day on Saturday, we've got an, another amazing event. PVUSD families jump into summer. So we are celebrating our families and we are having a wonderful event put on our parent engagement team. And that is on Saturday at EA Hall. The times are there on the flyer, 8.30 to 9, registration and breakfast, and then some welcoming, a couple of sessions. And then continuing that recruitment, we will do the recruitment efforts that are happening here in the boardroom on Saturday morning. I'll be working alongside Alicia at a recruitment table so that any family who wants to join our wonderful event at EA Hall doesn't have to choose between the recruitment fair and joining Jump into Summer. It's going to be a full stop um, for everybody. We can't wait. So again, at the central office, um, we've been super busy planning for our Kinder Roundup. Um, there are two dates in March, the 18th and the 19th, and there are two additional dates in April and plans for a May date if required. Um, putting this event together has been quite an undertaking, requiring our best collaborative effort. Um, as a result, though, more families will have access to more resources in one location for one of our favorite days, hopefully enrolling many new kinders and TKers into the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. This is accomplished through collaboration with Ed Services, SELPA, state and federal programs, student services, Expanded Learning, who's also offering the Pajaro Passport. Um, it's the Monterey Bay FC Soccer Club, free for after school students in grades TK, TK through eight and their families. Transportation, Migrant Head Start, Healthy Start, and Early Childhood Education, as well as our administrative and classified staff that are there for support. Um, our community partners will include Healthy Start, Aptos Public Library, Watsonville Public Library, and Salud para la Gente. At our site level, our administrators are in the midst of one of my favorite times of the school year. They're busy supporting and monitoring academic progress, social emotional learning, and parent engagement as they begin to bring this school year to the finish or to the end. And then simultaneously, they're also busy looking to the future and planning for next school year. They're in the midst of another iteration of refining processes, procedures, and the efforts of their teams to improve student outcomes. They're considering current data and plans for future professional learning and staff development. As we all know, it takes a village. And as a villager, I can tell you that at each and every level, it takes strong administrators, strong instructional staff, and a strong classified staff to support our students' growth and engage our parents and families as partners. We do this work together, proudly, never one without the other. So in closing, please know that together, we're planning both a strong finish and a momentous beginning for PVUSD. And finally, we just wanted to say, um, Pavan members are on the move in support of our students, families, and staff, and we're looking forward to hearing your support as well. So thank you very much. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you both. And now we will move to 8.4, Communication Workers of America. This is our substitute group, CWA. Do we have you here? Thank you. Here Welcome. You testing, testing. Mm -hmm. All right, good evening, Board of Trustees, Interior, Interim Superintendent Sheckman and President Acosta. Um, my name is Mike Floor. I've been a substitute in the district for 20 years. I'm a certificated teacher 
and an LPAC tester. I'm also the first union steward that the local um, from this district representing CWA. David Romo, similar credentials. Mm -hmm. He's a certificated teacher as well. He's been subbing longer than me. He's been LPAC testing longer than me. He trained me to do the LPAC testing. And then the two of us trained all the new LPAC testers because in 2020, during the COVID era, with the double computer generated test, it was too complicated for the existing team. 98% of those testers quit and retired. So we are responsible for training all these new testers. They got a big raise. We got a pay reduction. The pay reduction is, is uh, a byproduct of a negotiated contract that included a supplemental rate standardization before we got involved. It was negotiated by someone that isn't from our district. So we are living and learning. And the aforementioned moment with Brian Saxton, I was going to come and bring this up in December. We had a meeting earlier in the day. He kind of persuaded me to handle this in-house. And he said, maybe me and you and David and Director Brooke Hopkins can have a sit down and we negotiate this privately so you don't have to take it to the board. He did not want you to hear about this. And when we did this two weeks later, he told us matter of factly that we had no pot to beep in, that that was just the way it was and there was nothing we could do. When I talked about unionizing us, he threw out all these resistances to it, citing that anybody can do LPAC testing, that it isn't necessarily a certificated position, yet they don't hire anybody except certificated people to do LPAC testing. So it's sort of like we're damned if we do, damned if we don't. Um, I got some responses from a couple people on here about this, and we just want to make what we were making last year. We got a $1.71 pay reduction. His attitude towards us is sorry, that's just the way it is, guys. Now, we are versatile, colorful, experienced classroom managers and teachers and testers and after-school employees. I've done like every other job in this district. On top of that, I did work a year as a teacher, which you might remember, Mr. Sheckman. That was 10 years ago at AVCI before it became Diamond Tech. The worst year of my teaching 20 years. That was a horrible experience, and I'm glad that I got through it the way I did. Now, I would like to um, work with the teachers union with P PVFT. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but judging by the, res by the movement of all the ethnic studies people and then the long negotiated contract that CSEA has just finished, get ready for us, Mr. Saxton, because we're organizing. We're going to be collective bargaining as soon as we possibly can, and I'd like to give the rest of the okay. time to introduce David Romo as a brand new union steward. He's been freshly yeah. trained too. Yeah, we're, we actually work for the federal and state programs, which is, this is the test, the LPAC test is a federally mandated test. And we, a lot of your students in this district are ELs, English learners, and they continue to be English learners. We make try to make a difference because a lot of times you're in the classroom, you don't get a chance to opportunity to even speak. So we give those uh, students for up to an hour to, to talk and to share who they are. And we can make the difference in a positive score or a negative score, just based on our attitudes and where, how we are. We do a, a great job of testing the students. And I think the district right now is lagging in respect to getting these students redesignated and the numbers are very, very low, and it could be even worse because what's happening now is, oh, I started with the LPAC test, I mean, the, the SALT test. After a while, the students started to hate the test because they were consistently given the test year after year after year, and they're not being reclassified. I'm, still, I'm seeing that resistance now at the high school level especially. Kids are avoiding the test. They don't even walk to get the test. They take off. They leave campuses. Uh, we do a great job trying to get these kids motivated to take the test. I tested 200 people my first year doing this type of testing. I told them, do well, you will never have to take this test again. We do our job. We hope the teachers do their job, and we hope you guys do your job, and pay us fairly, please. Please. Yeah. Um, excuse me, David 
and I'm sorry, I caught your name, David Romo, and sir, what was your name Mike again? Floor. What Floor. is your name again? I'm sorry. Mike Floor. Mike. Yeah. Mike Floor. Yeah. Thank you. I just Floor. wanted, huh? Floor. Right? F L O O R. Yeah. I just wanted to be able to acknowledge you by your name. Thank you. Thank Floor you for being here this evening. <laughs> get the pen <laughs> okay thank you both um, now moving on to our action items I'm going to move us to 9.1 the adoption of resolution to authorize the general obligation bond election of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District this report will be presented by our interim superintendent Murray Sheckman and uh, of schools as well as Dale Scott president of Dale Scott and company Lisa's going to kick it off and turn it over Good evening, Board President Acosta and Board of Trustees, Interim Superintendent uh, Mr. Sheckman. Um, I have the privilege this evening to kick off for looking at the next uh, bond um, possibility. When I first entered this district uh, roughly nine to ten years ago, we just passed Measure L. When I came, Measure L, when I came in here from a different district, I had the opportunity to look at the facilities from an outside lens perspective. Our facilities were in really bad shape. We had holes in ramps, we had holes in buildings. We had a lot of work to do. Measure L provided us with some of the monies that we use to upgrade our buildings, to have um, spaces where our students can feel proud of. During, when we went out for that bond, we knew that it wasn't the amount of money that we would need to completely upgrade our facilities. Some of the comments you heard this evening from students, there was um, in the original plans for Pajaro Valley High School was the pool and also a theater. Because we ran out of funds, this was not able to be completed. So in the next round with the next bond that we have the opportunity to go after more money so that we could have an excellent facilities for all of our students across the district in places that they'll be proud to learn. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Sheckman. Thank you, Ms. Aguirre. Um, I really wanted Lisa to start it off because she was here while the discussion and the planning was going on. And so her background and knowledge helps us. Oh, I, he'll need it. I won't need it. I'm going to introduce our presenter. Um, so Lisa's knowledge and background is a, a good way to kick this off. I was involved with Measure L and expressed concern to Cabinet that are we really ready? And my concern was mostly based on the fact that I wasn't here. The planning was good. Uh, Clint was our CBO at that time and he helped bring me up to snuff. And I made sure he was here tonight for the bond uh, presentation in case questions come up. And he's very grateful to be here for this evening's meeting. The bond that we had before was led by a very active CBO. We are advertising, hopefully beginning tomorrow, and we waited till tomorrow for a reason, so we can get the best CBO, somebody with experience who knows how to carry the torch for a bond. Dale reached out to me and spent several hours with me and made sure I had a really good understanding of the good work and planning that's gone on into this bond. One of the board members asked us to look at a, a bond that was a little bit less, and so we are bringing you two proposals. But you'll also hear, if you look at the study of our master plan and the facilities, the facilities master plan, we really could use 900 million to do everything. But we won't ask the taxpayers that. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dale Scott, who's got some really good information for the board. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Um, I have been asked to give you a very short presentation. Um, <laughs> just to give you, much of this we've gone over already, but I thought it would be good to reacquaint you with it, and then I'll talk a little bit about the resolutions and the, and the issue before you. Um, just to remind you, um, we always look at the type of election that we are looking at, we're thinking about putting a ballot on. Um, there's a tendency to always believe that all elections are created equal, but they're just not. There's just a big difference in who turns out. This, you obviously know this, you're elected officials. Um, you can see on this chart the turnout for the presidential elections in Santa Cruz County, um, which is in blue. In the November, for example, for the November 2020 election, the turnout was almost eight, was approximately 85%. Look right next to it, the June 2022 gubernatorial primary, the turnout was less than 50%. Uh, the data is very clear that the higher the uh, presidential election, 
produces a higher percentage of school bonds that win in California. That's been in the case for over 20 years now. Um, and especially tilts to those districts which have a high Democratic uh, uh, registration, such as your district, which you can see in the pie chart. This district has been on the ballot uh, four times. Um, there was a couple of failures in the early, in the last part of the century. Um, however, at that, that time there was a two-thirds majority that was required. Um, in each case, the district has always received over 55 percent. Um, and you can look and see that none of these elections were on a presidential date, which is interesting to think about, even in the gubernatorial elections. And uh, one primary, the district one. Those bonds the, that have been passed are still being paid off. Uh, one of them, the 2002 election, is going to drop off the rolls shortly in six years, um, and that will drop the, the average tax rate down to roughly $30 per $100,000 of assessed valuation. Looking forward at the 2024 election, There are, as the superintendent said, two proposals, two resolutions in front of you. So it's not, shall we pass both? <laughs> it's, shall we pass one or the other? Um, both of them are relatively uh, the same, except for the dollar amounts. The first one, which is for $315 million, is structured so that the tax rate would be generally $60 per $100,000 of assessed valuation. That's all property within the district, except for, of course, government and churches, so depending on uh, commercial, industrial, uh, residential, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even though we've shown an example here of how the bonds might be issued um, over the next six or seven or eight years, that would be up to the district board itself. Uh, you can draw on these monies however you want, for however long you want, as quickly as you want, or as long as you want. The second resolution uh, envisions a, a financing, I'm sorry, a bond issue of $195 million, and that would, uh, is estimated to drop the tax rate down to roughly $40 per 100,000 of assessed valuation. A question I'm asked quite often is, um, well, what does that mean? How much does that really cost the, the taxpayer? So I thought you'd be interested in this slide. This is the district's uh, single family home tax base, uh, broken down in $100,000 increments. So as you can see, if you look at the top bar, you have roughly 1,500 homes in your district that are on the rolls at less than $100,000. On the other hand, uh, the average, if you look at the blue box on the left, you can get some of the statistics, the average single family home is assessed at roughly $600,000. So there's, the median is about $460,000. So you can get a sense of what the average is going to be paying, what the median is going to be paying. There are obviously a very large number of homes, uh, much higher than that, assessed over a million dollars. So the, assess the assessment is on the assessed valuation. So in, in, for example, if you were to pass the resolution for the larger bond, it would be roughly $60 per $100,000 of assessed valuation. <coughs> Finally, um, just discussing the activities that are required to move forward, um, the board needs to take it, if the board wants to proceed, it would need to take action on one of the two resolutions this evening. I'll talk about that in just a second. We would then submit that, those resolutions to the uh, elections department of both Santa Cruz and Monterey County, since you have a few voters in Monterey County. There would also be something that's called the argument phase, where um, the district has the opportunity to place an argument in favor of the resolution that would show up in the sample ballot, and anybody that wants to oppose it can put in an argument in opposition. And then although we still, we still continue to call it election day, of course it's no longer election day, it's election month, um, it's just that we ended on election day. I do want to go back to this board action, and I do want to make one thing clear. Um, when the law changed, allowing for 55% elections, there was another change that was made, and that is that even though the threshold for voter uh, passage is 55 percent, the thres threshold for board passage is two-thirds. Not two-thirds of the members in attendance, two-thirds of the seated members. So what that means is in order to pass either of these resolutions, you would have to have a 5-0 board 
vote tonight. So, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about the presentation or about the resolution. Or we, we also are going to have Rich do a, a presentation to connect the master plan of facilities right. to the work that you guys okay. have done. Thank you. Right, Mr. Adriano? Good evening. Um, not really a presentation, but I can just give a little bit of the background on, on how the facilities master plan kind of fits into this and, and where that all started. Um, so facilities master plan was, uh, uh, let's see, we started with a, re a request for proposals back in, I believe, 2019 to find a, um, a partner architect firm to work with us to develop the master plan. Um, we ended up contracting and awarding with uh, 196 architects and in 2020 everything kind of got derailed with what they were starting up with their community input sessions and, and kind of starting to gather information on what sites uh, needed um, what they wanted what their um, you know what their constituents for their for their schools wanted to see accomplished with the next bond it, it, it started way back then so um, that is a document that is almost finished. It's uh, about a month away from being finalized and it'll be presented to the board very soon, like once it's, once it's ready. Um, the kind of napkin estimate from that facilities master plan shows somewhere between 500 million and $600 million in need for the projects that were identified on the master plan. Um, so that's the brief on um, on what that document is and, and kind of how it fits in with, with what we're looking at now. And I just wanted, Rich, to make sure you understood that, that there was some good work in the development of our facilities master plan, and Gail has worked with that plan and come up with proposals for uh, tentative bond. Thank you, Rich. So, Dale, back to you and questions from the board. All right, Mr. Scott, I'm going to um, have to see if we have any public speakers to this item. Yes, we have two. So the, for agenda item 9.1, we have Chris Webb, and we also have one more person. Thank you, Rich. I want to speak to one project that I think could fit with this uh, bond and also with the master plan. And that would be a backup generator for Renaissance High School. You may recall at the beginning of quarter three here, there were three schools that were closed due to weather, and Renaissance was one of them. And I think that was the right decision, by the way, to close it. Um, when you have no power at that school, there's no water, which means no toilets. Um, so that was a good decision by the, the powers that be. Um, but it's also like very commonplace, and I worry in light of the declining enrollment conversation, like in climate change, uh, at what point are we losing revenue by not having backup power at that site? Um, and I would pose to whatever the whatever new CBO we have for them to actually calculate that. Consider, let's say, 65% enrollment and then also like 95% enrollment. And then also with those two, consider like 65% attendance, 95% attendance for both and then figure out, get four, four numbers where with, after this many days of school closures, it actually costs you more to not have backup power. I feel, I feel like um, with different grants and stuff I've seen related to green energy, um, there, there should be opportunity even beyond these bonds to get that funding. And I would also um, remind the board, the Renaissance Student Leadership uh, survey results for Measure L funds were shared with you earlier in the year and uh, to your emails. And so you can see the data, and you, one thing you might notice in the data is that uh, when the, the Renaissance community was asked about the use of Measure L funds, uh, if you look at the top five priorities in every single one, a backup generator outpolled um, the staff room, which is being funded. So I just consider the stakeholders and, and what's been said um, and what the data that we have shows about what people want. And then there's a, a financial case to be made, I think. So thank you for your consideration. The, the next speaker we have is Nick C. from the Parks and Recs to City of Watsonville. Now, I didn't want to mess up your last name. So. <laughs> Uh, good evening, President Acosta and uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, my name is Nick Kalabakib, and I'm here wearing three different hats tonight. Um, 
all of which I'm, I'm asking the, uh, the board to consider adopting the resolution to place this on the ballot in November. Um, I'm here first and foremost as a parent of a fifth and seventh grader um, in the district and um, have really seen the difference that the projects that have, that have been funded through Measure L have made on the different campuses. Um, and you know, really commend the district for using those funds wisely. And um, I, I, th I think we all know that there's a lot more work to be done, um, obviously from the, the facilities master plan and all the work that the former CBO um, Clint has worked on as well. Um, millions of dollars in deferred maintenance needs still. And um, you know, I wanted to, again, kind of point out or, or, or uplift some of the voices of the students from earlier today who talked about equity on different campuses and making sure that there's opportunities um, for students um, in an equal manner for things like theater and swimming and, and, and all of those great things. Um, with my Parks and Community Services Director hat on, um, you know, we work with the district on, on joint use facilities and help to um, open up campuses in the after school hours to make sure that our, our students have access to parks and open spaces. Um, here in Watsonville, we have a, a huge lack and disparity in terms of access to parks and open space compared to nearby communities. Um, like the city of Santa Cruz and our school spaces really are th those those places that um, that help with that <coughs> um, Quality fields and quality quality playgrounds and whatnot are really really important to me as well um, You know we, we all know I think also that a lot of our fields have things like gopher holes in them and that sort of thing And it's hard to uh, to, to play sports when um, you're dealing with that um, Finally, I'm here on behalf of Susie Merriam who is our community development director for the for the city And she wanted to talk a little bit about workforce housing. She wasn't able to be here tonight um, But um, she really believes that that um, this bond could help um, provide work ha uh, uh, Workforce housing for teachers especially and that as part of this bond measure PV USD would have the opportunity to raise funds to build housing for educators on school owned property um, Such as uh, the projects that Cabrillo and UCSC are working on. Thank you. Thanks Jack. Thank you. And that's the end of our public speakers on so that? No, no more speakers. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll bring it back to the board for discuss discussion, questions. I just try to mosh posh words together, make up my own. Discussion, questions from the board for any of the presenters. Oh, comments, too. Comments, questions, mm -hmm. anything. Just, that's discussion. I'll come up with a new word to mosh that all together. Trustee Dr. Holm. It's, it's more of a comment because um, I, I feel like we've we had great presentations in, in the past and we've had a lot of really good information and, and thank you for the additional you know, information that was, that was helpful. Um, I know for, for myself, I, I, I'm inclined to go for the larger bond because I mean looking at the amount of need that we have in this district and just you know it, having sat on this board for the last Five years and you know going to our sites and seeing the need I'm just like there is so much need there is so much need and then like thinking about it, it's like okay you know doing the math it's like if you are fortunate enough to own a million dollar home which is not uncommon in this area it's like it's 11 bucks a week right a couple of lattes if you get the really fancy ones with the extra shots right if you get if for the larger bond so it's like it's 11 bucks if it's a smaller bond it's just shy of eight bucks the difference between the bonds and what we could do with it it just to me it makes sense to to go for it because we need it that's my thought. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa? Dale, do you mind coming up to the podium? So in the past, we've always received a really heavy, robust presentation about what it is that needs fixing and why we're doing this. Because this is a giant ask of our community that already has bonds on their property taxes. So not only do we have multiple Pajaro Valley bonds, we have multiple Cabrillo College bonds, and we also have now Measure N, and the hospital's gonna go out for another bond. So we typically have a presentation that makes a case for why this is an urgent need on behalf of our district. Like I know why it's an urgent need, but in order to sell this idea to the public, 
typically there's a presentation that talks about at this school, here's what the needs are, at this school, here's what the needs are. So I'm disappointed that that didn't come in front of us tonight. I think it's strange to have a bond, like a vote on a bond prior to having a discussion about what the need is in the district. That's not to say I, want, I wouldn't register a vote tonight. Obviously, I, I know we need this, but I just think that this is not the way to introduce this to our community. So in terms of the first and second um, sums that we're looking at, do either one of those include workforce housing? Um, at, the, at the pleasure of the board, both of them have the ability to be used for teacher staff housing. That is something, of course, after it passes, you would have to actively decide upon. But both of them give you the ability to use those funds for workforce housing. Okay. And then can somebody come to the podium and talk to me about what the price tag is for the workforce housing that's been proposed? that we've looked at? Who can talk to that? Is there no one here? Oh, there's Clint Rucker. Oh, thank heavens. That's why he's here. Hey, Clint. Good evening, board. Good to see you all again. Um, yeah, when we discussed in the past uh, workforce housing, taking into account inflation as well, we thought it would be roughly around 60 million would probably be the target of what part of the bond would have to go to workforce housing to actually be able to utilize, I know we all talked about the space next to Amesti, as there was extra space behind that school that would actually be able to do it. And that's where we originally talked about workforce housing. When we talked uh, most recently with Dale and kind of talked with Ralph from 196, the estimated around was around 60 million. So if you take into account the $195 million bond, it only leaves around 130 million for schools whereas the 60, 315 bond would leave around still 250 for schools, which, again, I don't need to reiterate. The need's definitely there. So, Jen, I heard Jen Holmes say on a million-dollar house that it would only be about $11 a week. I love it. She's, like, right there. It's between 11 and 12. Yeah, you think about it. It's $60 per 100,000, so you think... A million has 10 100 thousands in it. So to do simple math, 10 times 60 is $600. 52 weeks, 10 times 52 is 520. Plus you have those two other weeks at $10. You know, so you're mm -hmm. you're right about there. It's between yeah, 11, 12 dollars a week. So you know, we have I loved it. So we have the number one. We have the fastest growing population of senior citizens in the entire state here in Santa Cruz County. And so when we go out. For, for example, a parcel tax, senior citizens can often opt out of having to pay that because of financial need. Is there any similar situation here for bonds for our I know seniors that are on fixed it, incomes? But I'll let Dale speak to it. Yeah. Um, no, there, under the state law, there is no ability to have any type of class base it on age or need um, opt out of payment of the assessed valuation. Yeah, I have more of it. Go yeah. ahead. You Maybe can go. Other people. No, it's okay. I'll think on it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Have me come back to you. Trustee Bellano Scow. Yes. Sorry, just for everybody watching, can we just summarize again? I want to make sure I get the monthly, weekly cost differential for beach bond. So the for the larger one is around forty-eight bucks a month, and the small smaller one sixty bucks a month. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't do the math that way. I only think of what the tax rate is on an annual basis. Yeah. Uh, the tax rate on an annual basis for the larger bond is $60 per $100,000 of assessed valuation. That's the, uh, that's the estimate. Okay. And the uh, lesser amount is $40 per $100,000 of assessed valuation. So, you know, with the calculator, you can come to that very quickly, but uh, I always think about what is that number per $100,000. The monthly amount is thirty-three dollars for the smaller one. Monthly amount is thirty-three or sixty, well, and for the for the larger, uh, and that's at it at for a million dollar home. Yeah, and the larger amount is fifty. And um, for those curious, the flexibility on f financing projects should it pass, is there a specific legally prescribed process on how that works, or is that how much flexibility does our district have once it passes? Regarding how you use once the it funds? passes, yeah. Um, within each resolution, uh, there is an exhibit called a project list. 
That project list is very extensive. Not only does it list uh, specific projects, it also gives the board fairly large, wide latitude to, do, to build projects will, which will improve the facilities of all of the schools and all of your other properties. However, which projects get financed and which projects are at the top of the list, that goes back to the board and has to be done by board decision after the, um, after the success of the election. There is also, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, there's also the requirement to have a citizen's oversight committee. And the citizen's oversight committee would then also be looking at those projects to make sure that those projects were indeed allowed for under the resolution. So there's sort of two pieces of the puzzle there. Thank you, Trustee Belanoska. Trustee Dr. Holm, did you have something you wanted to add? Just a okay. point of order. I was g gonna get there. I think we could get through this presentation. Okay. If you're okay. Trustee Dodge Jr., but I did set a timer. Uh, I kind of have to agree with Trustee DeSerpa and uh, you know, you're, you're asking us trustees to go to our neighbors you know, that own houses who vote and ask them to please support this bond. Uh, and if they ask us, well, what are, we, what are you guys gonna spend the money on? What, what do we show them? What do we tell them? I mean, I could speak, you know, for the things that we've done in, in my area, but as you heard tonight, people are still mad at PV. You know, what, what is, you know, trustee Scow or your trustee, you know, home maybe more or less, what are they supposed to tell you know, their constituents, their neighbors. So at this time, it's the resolution to move forward with it. As we go forward, and if it does pass, there will be a, the comprehensive list that we have of all the needs, which will show the dollar figure will out be larger than the bond, whether we go either bond that we go out for, and we will have that. Um, because we've done some preliminary work, there's not gonna be a um, door-to-door -door going like how we had done in the past because mm -hmm. of the preliminary work and the, the research that we have right now in terms of the favorability for the bond. It's more about educating our um, community in terms of the needs of the district and not necessarily selling the reason why we have to do it. Yeah, but we still have to go out and tell our neighbors, say, hey, could you vote for this bond? And you know, again, if you're in trustee scouts, they're going to say, well, where's you would, our poll? You would have that information. Okay. So, but that was it. Thank you. Trustee Bilano Scow. So with respect to that legal, so we're obviously there's a ton of interest at PV High for a swimming pool and a theater. And is that something we would specify? We would actually can, and how can you maybe speak to the campaigning around that if we think how, how that would, how we identify specific projects, if we think it'll help us pass the bond? Yeah, so um, I think as Dale noted and as Lisa was referring to, it's a multi-step process. So the first step is really saying that there is a need and that we want to put this on the ballot. The second step, if this was approved, then would begin MNO's work on starting to kind of show those projects, show what could we do at each site specifically. And then really that's also part of the board's uh, say in what you want to prioritize prioritize at each site, as well as those of you who remember, was anyone here? Kim was here for Measure L. You were here for most of Measure afterwards, though, right? So um, we did also site, school site councils actually voted as well on what they wanted. So I think the one thing I can say I took away from seeing Measure L is there needs to be a blend where the board and administration get to say, you know, you need new roofs. I know they're not the shiniest, coolest looking thing for your site, but you need new roofs. So that's going to be something we're going to do, say, at PV high. However, we also know that you're really interested in having a performing arts center. So that's going to be one of those things that also very high on the list. So the really specifics of what would be on each site will be kind of presented with the master plan, but it's also it's at the discretion of the board to be able to say, at this site, we really want to focus on A, B, and C. Because again, the master plan has a lot more improvements than each site can actually afford, unfortunately. Thank you, Clint. Is that all, Trustee Bolano Scow? For the at this time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Deserpa, did you have additional? Thank you. Um, so I think, yeah, I think like what you just said, one of the lessons learned is that we really wanted to get stakeholder input so that there would be buy-in for voting uh, on this, and we did tons and tons of work on at every site council meeting and PTA meeting and home and school club 
to, to actually walk campuses to find out what the needs were and what and how those things were prioritized and people spent a lot of time making those decisions and then later on because there were bigger needs like HVAC and roofs and plumbing and replacing toilets that had just been replaced <laughs> a lot of the things on those lists were not achievable yeah, so that goes back to what Rich was mentioning. Um, when 196 did their facilities master plan, it was not done in a vacuum. They actually walked the sites with the principals, looked at what their needs were, asked kind of what are your dream items you would love to see in your site? What are things that um, concerns you have? So the master plan kind of is a comprehensive list of things that have been asked for by the site and by the principal at that site. Um, but then the next step of that, I think, is on top of that of saying, we've identified now 10 really big needs for your site. What are the ones that now, to your point, school site councils may say, well, we actually now really want to focus on that. They would do that most likely once the bond's been passed. Because first they'll say, here's your list of 10 things that are for, for example, a MESTI. A is not going to necessarily dive down to here's what we want to do until they know that the bond actually has been passed and that what their allocation of funding would be, which is, again, determined at the administration and the board level of deciding how you allocate then those millions of dollars across all the district based on need. So it's definitely a step that still happens, just typically happens once you've established your major list and then have time just to meet with school site council, meet with parents, and actually have the full list of improvements as well as then them kind of narrowing down what they want and then to the point made earlier, also kind of helping guide them to that some things aren't necessarily negotiable at a site level when you need HVAC or you need roofing and Right now we're patching and actually need to be replacing. So, so in terms of, because we got a ton of ESSER money, that I, I think it was the ESSER monies, and we did a bunch of HVAC and roof work with those monies, right, and Measure L. So how many, if anybody knows, how many sites are left to do roofing and HVAC on? And that can be just, I won't hold anyone to it, but are we talking about like a third of our facilities? It, it would probably be a Herlinda. What I will say is a lot of what was done, whether it was with ESSER money or with just deferred maintenance money, is patching roofs. You're, you're getting by for the year or two. Every rainy season we're seeing the damage that's being done from storms. So you're slowly kind of catching up. I think what ends up happening with the ESSER, we did do a lot of the HVAC, things like that. Um, I will speak to, I know the board heard it because I remember sitting there hearing a lot, Watsonville High and asking, can we ever get air conditioning? Without a bond, it's just not something that the district ever has money to go in and install air conditioning in old classrooms like that. But that's definitely something that comes from building out a bond. Um, so I couldn't speak to exactly how many need roofing or need HVAC or potentially need parking lots. Um, but again, th that comprehensive list is being built. Okay, so we had multiple um, audits and we had a bond oversight committee that was great and we never had one finding. So we did a great job, I think, of managing the last bond that we had. So I feel really good about that and I think the public should feel really good about that. Um, and I'll, yeah, and I'll let other people ask questions. Trustee Dr. Holm. I just want to clarify one point because it was said publicly about the hospital bond. Like my understanding is they're not going out for another bond. They were talking about going out if the, the current one failed, but it looks like it's passed. You know, for district hospitals, they have to go out for an assessment. It's called an assessment, not a bond. And so um, anybody in their catchment area will, if it passes, it's, they're going to be assessed money. There's going to be more money that's needed to run the hospital. Okay. I work at a district hospital, so that's why, okay. how I know this. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holman, Trustee the Serpent, Trustee Polanosco. Thank you. So, can you, uh, Dale, what a political recommendation on the risks of going for the bigger bond versus the smaller bond? What are your What are your What's your summary on that? 
Well, I think this ties into one thing I wanted to just mention uh, uh, regarding the last comment. One of the reasons I believe the, the survey that we did, and you may all recall the survey was brought to you a few months ago that was uh, conducted of all the voters. I think one of the reasons that survey was so strong was because of the good job that you have done in the past. And many of the projects that, were, that are now within that project list are projects that were strongly supported in that survey, um, such as um, uh, uh, kind of career tech, such as robotics, such as replacing HVAC, et cetera, et cetera. And all in all, all of these projects, I don't recall a project within the entire survey that didn't have over 55%. There may have been one or two, but there were a lot done. But there was a strong sense that you had done something right. I'll get to your question in just a second. The second issue has to do with the timing. Remember that under California state law, you can have to have a general election to place an item on the ballot. And general elections are now interpreted as being either gubernatorial or presidential and the primaries. So your next opportunity, if it's not this one, is the California governor's primary in 26. Not a great date. The California's governor election, good, not great. And then the next is really 2028 for the next presidential ballot. Regarding the, the, the uh, question, is there any political risk of the higher? Well, there's some, of course. Uh, there is some people that say, no, that's too much. Just that we didn't find much of that in the survey. We found strong support for both amounts, uh, both ta tax amounts, not dollar amounts. Um, and there was strong support going in and strong support coming out uh, on, in the survey. So I don't think that that risk question is one that uh, it weigh, should weigh on you greatly. To Trustee De Serpa's point, it looks like the hospital bond will prob likely pass. They're right above the margin. They're waiting for some ballots. And I can't remember what the assessment is off the top of my head about the impact. But I think there is a point there that if people, they will see that additional cost, does that then affect the same voters' attitude? Might it? On, on our costs and, and it's I, I mean I know it's easy to say but I don't think so I think people for school bonds they're in a different zone and they think this is going to improve my property uh, the value of my property and this is going to improve my schools and that's what, what the survey showed. and I don't think that's going to be changed again it's a little glib to say it but I'll just put it this way the person who walks into the poll uh, the booth with a copy of their property tax bill is a no voter to begin with. Um, that person is, it doesn't really matter. Um, however, most people that are voting for it, they see a number of reasons that's going to help the community, going to help their own family, and going to help the children. Are your questions answered, Tristan? Uh, so you, you think we should go for the higher amount? No, I think you should go for the amount that you feel comfortable with. <laughs> I, I don't make that recommendation. <laughs> Trustee De Serpa. Just, um, Adam, there's, it's not just property owners that vote on this, it's anyone. Yeah. Any voter can vote on this, and that's why the threshold for 55% is fairly low. I mean, the only thing is Cabrillo went out for a bond of 300, and that did not go over well with the voters. I, yeah, I think ha having a bond on the presidential yeah. is important. Yeah. If we didn't make this decision today, could we make this down the road, or is there a t is there a time limit to putting there this is. on November? When is that? Um, roughly, um, roughly mid July would be the time okay. time limit. Mm -hmm. But we, it, it's good to probably start a campaign earlier, correct? Uh, it's good to start thinking how you're going to communicate with the voters earlier. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the interest rates are very high right now. Well, that depends on your perspective. Um, from my perspective, having lived through interest rates when they were 20%, they don't seem terribly high to me. But they're very high compared to um, a year ago. Um, so, but again, tax exempt, remember we were talking about tax exempt rates, they're, like, they're in the 4% range right now. So they're not extraordinarily oh, that's not bad. high. No. And it can be refinanced. And it can be refinanced. If they go down, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Trustee Sturba. I'm um, going to have to take Trustee Dr. Holm up on her point of order motion. I'm just going to ask that you think of 
all the action items we have left to get through are report and discussion items, consent agenda, and reporting out of closed session, which also includes voiding in public, so. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping we don't need this, but I'm gonna move to extend the meeting till one o'clock. Okay, I have a motion to extend the board's meeting to 1 a.m. I have a second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? You do not get a vote. <laughs> Motion carries 502. I voted to myself. <laughs> okay, and um, hold on. Let me make a note of this. Um, okay, and so Trustee Deserpa, did you feel, I don't want you to feel you got cut off. Do you feel that your questions? Okay. Um, anyone else have questions? Anyone? For the, okay. Um, okay, then, then there was one. Um, so I'm, um, I've heard concerns from at least two of my colleagues this evening about the timing and maybe wanting to have a presentation um, centered around the need, which demonstrates the argument, you know, kind of like before putting. I mean, I almost kind of feel the same sense. We're putting the cart before the horse. So, and I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Scott, you just sort of, I think, spoke to that. So is it possible that, because you do need a two-thirds majority, and we're barely there tonight, um, do, by present members, um, is it possible that we could bring this back at the next board meeting with, with a presentation surrounded around it uh, for the need? that I maybe it would help appease some of this concern. So whether it be the next board meeting or one in the future, I don't know because we have to get the comprehensive list which is being done by um, the firm that we um, hired to do it. So can we guarantee that it'll be ready to go with the f full presentation by the architects that we have hired? No. Can we guarantee that we can have a presentation with the needs of our facilities where you heard some of them this evening by students and with pictures? Yes. Okay, so I'm just, I'm entertaining this out of the concerns that I've heard that it's an option, um, if that would help appease some of the concerns that we've heard, but I'm gonna open that to my colleagues and see, you know, what their sense of feeling is on that, or if they're ready to move forward tonight. Well, well my only trepidation or concern would be just in making the decision between the two sizes, I would, I am wanting to feel a little more confident about, but I hear the answers about this process and maybe there's, that day can come and the the logic, the intellect around wanting that is, is obviously very sound to me. Um, so I, I think, unless, if you can persuade me to go for the bigger bond tonight, that we should do it, I'm open to being persuaded, but otherwise, maybe a little more information is good. Thank you, Trustee Blanca. Trustee Dr. Holm. We've known for, for years that we have hundreds of millions of dollars in deferred maintenance. If, I mean, I, I know you and I know many of us have, have done site visits and have seen the conditions of many of our schools. We know the need is there. We've had multiple presentations about you know the workforce housing. We know we have the need. We know there's the need. That's, that's not the question. You know, specifying the need, that's what gets determined after we decide to move forward. So let's do, decide to move forward. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee DeSerpa. Well, I, I do um, agree with you that we know what the need is. We know we've been here a long time. The truth is, really all seven members should be here for this vote, and it should be a unanimous vote if we're gonna move forward. Even if it's not, it still could move forward, but I do hope that we could all come to a unanimous decision on this, and I think that shows um, some solidarity as we go out to our community and ask them. This is a big, it doesn't seem like it when you say, oh, it's only $40 per, 
it's really expensive for a lot of people. And so we shouldn't take this uh, lightly. Um, I do believe that this increases people's property value. Everybody does want good schools and and we need, I think, to be unified as a board moving forward. And I would like to see a presentation uh, that the community can see and can go on and take a look at about what, what it is we aim to do. Because right now, we're saying there's a need, but there's really no proof to our community and constituents about that, except our word. So anyway, so I would be, um, I would feel better if we were all here and I think we could put this off to potentially the next board meeting or afterwards. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Dodge Jr., did you have any additional comments? Uh, I'd be willing to vote now with Trustee Holm. As she says, we, we know the need at Watsonville High. Air condition, we, we've seen it. You know, I represent schools that are almost 100 years old. My grandparents attended the schools I represented, uh, you know, and so that's how I feel. But if, if the rest of the board thinks differently, I support that too. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Trustee Bolano Scow. Can, can I ask you a question? Trustee Dodge Jr., you're saying you're, you're comfortable with a bigger bond? If we are going to do it, this would be the best timing. Because, you, know, you know, as we all know, turnout is higher in presidential elections, as the consultant has said. And I, you know, if we're going to ask, ask big and let, <coughs> let the voters decide. I'm wondering what President Acosta's opinion is. <laughs> asking President Acosta for her opinion. Well, my first thing is that I want to respectfully make sure all of your voices are heard. Um, I, 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 I do um, cite, I mean, again, I, I agree pretty much with it, what everyone said up here. I, we understand and we know the need. And many of us are boots on the ground going on tours at the school sites and doing that and we drive through these neighborhoods because we live in these neighborhoods and we know it from an intimate place of being one of the seven people up here but I, I also have heard what trustee dodge jr said early and what trustee deserpa said i don't know that enough of an argument was made to the community tonight in presentation for that for us to be able to support that to the constituency bases that we're accountable to. And I find that concerning. I also agree with the echoing sentiment. Um, you know, things happen inevitably, and, and two board members had urgent things that came up, and that happens, and they couldn't be here tonight. I would like to see it come back with a presentation about the things that we're looking to do, and again, with the resolution with that, and hopefully all seven are here, and all seven hopefully would unanimously pass it, although I'm not counting votes before that happens, right? So that's kind of where I'm lying. And I, I, th I think it's possible for it to be done for the next board meeting. If not, then the next regular board meeting on April 24th, is it? Yeah, would be after that. We'll work with the architects to see if we can get it then, and we'll let them, know, you know, tell them that it is um, something that we want to have done hurriedly. But um, when, so yeah, we'll let you know. How far into it are they? So again, it's it started back in 2019, and they right. worked on what they could through the pandemic. Um, but in, I mean, in part of the resolution is that project list, right? And I, um, hopefully, not overstepping. I wouldn't want to see. A presentation that gets into the specifics before you get too far down the road. Well, the project list is just in, a right? list of things that potentially could be worked on. It's it's kind of the kitchen sink. But they're identified. They are they are things that are no needs at our sites. They're very broad. I get I get that. But they are. It, it is the project list that goes with in 2010 the or what, what 2012 is when we passed our bond there was tremendous amount of work that went into the needs at every single one of our campuses we still have that list don't yep. we sure and we, we know what's been worked on on that list because we have all of the measure L projects so do they have that information and are they looking at that the previous bond the measure L projects that were yeah that were done? not 
achieved. I'm sure that's we yeah. we have that info. Jenny yep. just prepared a report that I read that showed the money that's still left over, and it's certainly not much for Measure L. So we have very specific info about what was purchased or what was built, and what is still lingering. And I'm sorry to ask this question because it might have been that I missed a, boor a board meeting this last year. Has workforce housing been presented to the public? Do they even know we're thinking about this? Because that's all been in closed session as far as I know. It is my understanding that your discussion on workforce housing was in closed session. There's certainly information in tonight's written report. Okay, so that's the other piece is that that needs to be presented about, okay. yeah about what it is, where it's potentially going, how many units, what we're hoping to achieve, all of that needs to be very transparent because that's I'd really like exciting. To, what I'd like to propose based on body language here is that we come back next meeting with the info that you were requesting. But I also want to remind you, and I'm not pushing the vote tonight because I, where I agree with uh, Board Member De Serpa is seven board members voting for a bond initiative that the community will enjoy. We had tough discussion over Measure L, led to some compromise and ended up with a 6-1 vote that was that worked. We had one gentleman who needed a tour of PV High, but I want to stress to this board, this is your chance. PV High was well represented tonight. We had four kids talk about the theater. One young man acted out what he needs. And this is our, your chance, not tonight maybe, but to really give consideration to what PV needs. We talk about equity, um, and you've had it well represented tonight. Measure L, and I was a, an active part, we didn't have it all done when the vote took place. We worked with those school site councils to get very specific. So I just want to say that it's not too late. You're in a position to make it happen. I can gauge your body language tonight. But having two board members not here, I do think, is significant. But it's really important if we bring it back next time. You finish the sentence. You've got to all be here. But I'm preaching the choir. I think Thank you. one of the things that would be helpful is mm. not only that some of the plan is there, but then what the costs are. Like, okay, a performing arts center is likely going to cost X amount of dollars. And then people will be able to sort of, we'll be able to put it together. Like, okay, if we want to pool, which I'm, I don't know that we can put a pool at PV High. I don't remember that that was a thing that we could do. But, I mean, we should have those types of discussions about cost, what's going to be left over, how much workforce housing is going to cost, and then we'll know which, potentially which bond to go for. Based we can, on how we much can we have can those achieve. Um, put together and the numbers come. One thing that I'm going to caution you on yeah. is once you start talking about specific facility items, then the public is going to think that that's what you're doing. And then if it's decided that that's not going to take place, then they're going to feel that you broke a promise to them. Well, we're talking about the big ticket items, like the Performing Arts Center. Like, that's a must do to bring equity to that campus, right? To bring equality across the district yeah. is an absolute must do, but what happens if it doesn't happen? That's why with the bond in Exhibit C, it is in general terms, and then once it's passed, you get more specific because you don't want to give any false promises beforehand. Yeah, but the public needs to hang their hat onto something. Yeah, it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. I, I would echo on that that I think I, under, I understand both of yours reservations about specifics. I, I understand that. And I, before being here, sat on a citizens bond oversight committee. Um, so, so, I mean, I think there's a way to do, I think, what we're kind of asking and not having to be nitty gritty, you know, to the detail, but that it's more of this holistic proposal of these are the things we can do. And if we know for instance, if workforce housing is going to be that top number one priority, then you know why couldn't that be expressed in that manner that this is the direction the board is looking, that this being its top number one priority, things can change. But yeah, you know, I, I think totally there's a agree. way. I totally agree and we'll do it. I just want to caution you as the board because it will come back to you. Right. And if we could do it as a way that it's not 
you know, this finite detail, this is, this is what it's going to be because things change that even the seven of us don't Absolutely. control. Absolutely, yep. So how would you like to see this? Would you like to see a motion to table this and bring it back? That would work. Because it is an action item. I would encourage you to make a motion to bring it back next meeting. Okay, and I, oh, yes, Mr. Well, Scott. Can I just ask that you not make a specific date <laughs> for when you're going to bring it back uh, as soon as possible, I think would be How about as soon as possible? Yes, uh, okay. yeah, because who knows what's happening on those days and who knows what's happening with your board members, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So. And you're going to be on vacation, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to take that <laughs> <laughs> Well, also, we want, to, we want to see the reports. So if the report isn't ready yet, then we don't want to bring it back too soon. Interim, Mr. Sheckman will have it ready and bring it back. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, our very next closest upcoming board meetings, regularly scheduled board meetings, is going to be Wednesday, March 27th, and Wednesday, April 24th. So if it works, mm -hmm. I mean, and work because we're trying to help from, I think, also what we heard from Mr. Scott, the sooner the better that we can move on this. And so, so given that um, and the language we've been provided, can I get a motion that w would um, table this to come back? at the next soon as possible regularly scheduled board meeting. I'd like to make a motion to table this and bring this back uh, as soon as possible to the ne next regularly scheduled board meeting. Thank you, you did that so well, Trustee Blanoscao. Uh, the second. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? The motion carries 502. Thank you, Mr. Scott, for your patience with us this evening. All right, now we will move on to item 9.2 to consider approval and certification of the 2023-2024 second interim budget report. And this report will be presented by Director, Director of Fiscal Service, Jenny Ein. Welcome, Ms. Ein. Sorry, is this on now? Thank you. My name is Jenny M. I am the Director of Fiscal Services here to present our second interim budget report. So the second interim budget report provides um, financial and um, budget updates from July 1st through January 31st. So it includes um, updates from the first half of our school year. The purpose is to certify that we can meet our financial obligations for the current budget year plus two succeeding years with a positive certification. The second interim is also the first opportunity for us to bring forth um, any impacts from the governor's budget proposal that was released in January. And before I dive deep into um, our, our budget, I wanted to just spotlight some of the highlights um, that are really student-centered and innovative um, that we were able to accomplish with our budget. So one thing is um, we are the only district in the county that is 100% A through G for our 26 ET pathways. We have the most ro robust arts program offered in the county even before Prop 28. We have an innovative ethnic studies program that is leading the way both within and outside of the county. We are expanding full day TK to nine elementary schools next year. We offer free home to school transportation for all students. We offer free expanded learning programs district wide, before school, after school, intercession, and in the summer. So um, that totals um, around 207 additional days of expanded learning that our students um, have. And of these days, 80 are intercession, which are considered non-school days, which exceed the state requirement of 30 non-school days. So I think that's a really, really great accomplishment. We're growing our dual language programs that celebrate the assets of our multilingual learners. We offer the best health and welfare package of any school district in the county, and I would argue um, probably within the Bay Area. And we have um, district technology innovation coaches that work directly with teachers to line curriculum and projects to key content areas. So I think this really highlights how innovative, ambitious, and visionary our district is um, with our passionate teachers, educators, and our classified staff. So I feel very proud to work here. I like to start off every budget um, uh, presentation talking a little bit about the district budget timeline, as well as how the state's um, process impacts our budget. 
So the last time I was here um, was in December presenting first interim. Since then in January, the governor released his um, governor's budget proposal for 24-25. So today is going to be the first opportunity where I can share the impacts of that. Um, between January to May, the governor is negotiating with the Senate and the House on the state priority and funding levels. So the May revision is going to come out and then we'll have the opportunity to present the impacts in June with the adopted budget. These are some key highlights from the 24-25 governor's budget proposal. So at first in term, um, we spoke a little bit about how at that time, the legislative analyst office um, presented um, some concerns that the revenue um, from the state would see a multi-billion dollar shortfall. So um, in the governor's budget proposal, the Department of Finance um, came out and said that there's an anticipated $44 billion state revenue shortfall. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that happened in the next slide. Um, the concerning thing on top of that is the Legislative Analyst Office is now considering this a rosy outlook. And they are projecting um, a higher revenue shortfall of $50 billion. So um, because of that shortfall, the LCFF funded COLA for next year has decreased from 3.94% to an expected 0.76%. Um, what the LAO is saying um, pretty recently is that they are actually suggesting a 0% COLA. So we'll kind of see what happens um, at the May revise. Um, 2526 has also decreased from 3.29% to 2.73%. And what um, it seems the governor is trying to do is, with the 0.76% COLA, um, he wants to hold harmless school districts to prior year funding. But because most school districts in California are experiencing declining enrollment, what this is causing is um, an actual decline in LCFF rev revenues over prior year. So how did the um, state revenue shortfall happen. So the main reason is because the 2022 tax filing was delayed until November last year. So when the state enacted their budget for 23-24 in June, they didn't have actuals in yet, so they were still going off of um, projections. Um, the interesting thing about California is that the top 1% of Californians generate 50% of personal income tax revenue for the state. And personal income tax makes up 60% of our state's general fund um, budget. So what that gives us is a lot of volatility. And that graph shows um, capital gains um, over uh, the last uh, decade or so. And we can see in that spike right around 2021 and 2022, that there was a very unexpected um, spike during COVID. And I'm sure we all remember when the stock market was going crazy. So what happened at that point was the state received a lot of unexpected revenue that they put towards a lot of the COVID-19 pandemic funding, the one-time funding, as well as the one-time block grants that we received. Um, when they enacted the 23-24 budget, they had overestimated where we would be with the capital gains. So because it came in a lot lower, um, out of the $44 billion revenue shortfall, an estimated $30 billion is because of the capital gains. And just remembering again, so we saw that spike in 21 um, and 22. So we can see here in this graph showing the history of our LCFF COLA, that we also see a corresponding spike in the COLA in those years. Um, so what, what we're seeing right now is that is pretty atypical of the level of LCFF COLA that we have received since Prop 98 was enacted back in 2013-14. So what we may be seeing is that even though these new COLAs seem shockingly low compared to the last few years, it may be a return to um, a normal. So in the next several slides, I will be going into some of the assumptions and planning factors for second interim. 
So we saw this slide at first in terms, so I wanted to bring it back because I think this is going to be one of the most important um, assumptions um, when we're thinking about our budget and our multi-year projections. So from first interim, we now have our official um, certified CBEDS numbers. So our official numbers for the current year came in right around the same as it was at first interim, 36 students higher. We're keeping our enrollment projections for the out years the same for now. And we just recently received um, updated data from our demographer decision insight. So we'll be able to incorporate that um, at adopted budget. So what we can see is we've been in historic declining enrollment. Um, exasperated by the historic floods as well as the pandemic. Um, what we're also seeing is that um, if you look at each grade level and the enrollment levels at each grade level, right now our highest grade is grade 12 that's outgoing. So that's where our bubble is. Our current enrollment there is 1,387. And when we're looking at our incoming grades, um, first grade has 976. Kindergarten has 995. So between kindergarten to 12th grade, that's a difference of 392 students. And that is um, likely attributable mostly to um, the fact that we're at uh, historic uh, lows with birth rates and families are uh, leaving California. So the district is funded on the greater of current year, prior year, or um, the most recent three years average, we'll, we can call that the rolling three-year average. So the rolling three-year average was enacted during, um, the, during COVID to provide a little bit of a cushion to districts that are experiencing declining enrollment. So what we can see in the blue line is that's our funded ADA, that is our three-year um, average. The red line below is our actual ADA. So we can see in the beginning, there's um, a greater um, variance between the funded and the actual because we were seeing the benefit of the higher uh, pre-COVID years. Um, as we're getting further into the out years, that gap is shortening, and that's because we are losing that benefit of the higher ADA years that was um, giving us a little bit of an artificial jump temporarily. And what this chart shows is the difference between our LCFF revenue projections from first interim to second interim. So that yellow line was um, our LCFF projections if we had the 3.9% COLA. The red line is if we had the 1%. So I had showed an alternative MYP when it came to board last, um, last time. And the blue line is where we are with the 0.76 COLA. So the governor's budget proposal actually came in less than what the LAO was saying back in December. So in addition to the decreased COLA because of the declining enrollment, um, what we're seeing is um, pretty significant decreases in our LCFF revenues year over year. The reason that this is very important for our district is because LCFF revenues make up 96% of our unrestricted general fund. So this is essentially our bread and butter, and this is what funds our general education program. Where I want to draw your eyes um, is to the bottom um, around where the red uh, box is. So what this shows is um, second interim and then our two out years. So we can see on the bottom our LCFF statutory COLA um, and then the actual realized COLA. So what that means is even though we see the 8.22% COLA for this year, next year 0.76%. Because of declining enrollment and because our ADA is lower than, um, than in past years, um, the actual dollar amount that we're receiving this year is only 3.79% higher than previous year. And in the next two years, we're essentially seeing a negative realized COLA because of the declining enrollment. And while our revenues are decreasing, our, the costs of doing business are unfortunately continuing to go up, including for salaries and benefits, which make up the largest part of um, our expenditures. So we can see here the assumptions for the current year plus the two um, succeeding years. 
So we can see for our CalPERS rate, those are increasing year over year. So are our health and welfare increases. This year it was a 10% increase over last year. Um, we received preliminary information for next year, which is between 6 to 9%. So we budgeted um, a little bit more moderate at 8%. Um, we have step and column, and one thing I wanted to point out is for the next two years, we don't have any costs for negotiated increases budgeted yet. And this slide shows a summary of major changes from first to second interim for our unrestricted general fund. So we can see um, at first interim, we were showing to be deficit spending um, just by a little bit. And because of mostly savings that we're seeing from vacancies, um, now at second and term, um, we are no longer deficit spending. And I, I predict by estimated actuals, and when we close the books, we will realize a little bit more savings. We have, um, we have currently, I believe, around 20 FTE vacancy for certificated, that includes management and around, um, I believe, 70 to 75 FTE vacancies for classified out of our general fund. So um, at estimated actuals, we will see the savings um, from those from January 31st through, um, through when we create the budget for that time. And what this slide shows is um, the current budget year plus the two out years. And in the red, that shows in the unrestricted general fund what we are projecting to um, deficit spend in the next two years. Um, again, that is um, mostly attributable to our declining um, revenues because of our enrollment, as well as our increasing um, ongoing costs. Um, we will likely see um, some savings from vacancies in the out years as well as um, site and department budgets that are unexpended. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that as we get into especially year three, 25, 26, that level of deficit spending, we won't be able to make that up through those kinds of savings from vacancies and from um, supplies and services. Um, that is what we consider an ongoing structural deficit. And this slide shows the components of our ending fund balance and the general fund unrestricted. Um, in the red on the bottom, that shows our 3% required uh, minimum reserve. That is mandated by the state. And in order to maintain a positive certification, we must maintain that we can't, we can't spend into it. In the orange, that is our board committed amount. So that includes the additional reserve that was committed, I believe, back in 1617. And for this year, um, it includes the four uh, teacher EWR days for next year. So really, what we have available to us is in the blue and in that yellow. And we can see by the uh, by 2526, um, because of the deficit spending, we're really eating down into are available um, reserves. So the, the concern with me is what happens after 25, 26. So we're going to see 26, 27 for the first time I adopted budget as part of our required MYP. This slide shows a summary of major changes from first to second in term for our restricted. So we can see that there hasn't been overall much change from first in term. And one thing I wanted to say is that the um, deficit spending in the restricted general fund, that is planned. And that is mostly because we have several block grants, one-time block grants, um, that are for uh, multi-year strategic plans where we received all of the funds up front. So we have that in the fund balance, and we'll be spending that down over um, multiple years. In this slide, I, I just wanted to break down all of the restricted programs that make up that restricted balance, because I know there's been a lot of um, questions about that in the past. So I wanted to show exactly what grants um, the restricted ending fund balance um, is tied to. So um, we spoke about this at first interim, um, but 100% of our restricted fund balance is tied to specific grants with specific allowable uses as a condition of um, applying and receiving those grant uh, dollars.
So our remaining COVID-19 one-time grant, um, which are ESSER, and we have a little bit of ELOGs um, going into 23, uh, 24. So those are going to um, be coming to their deadline in September of this year. Um, so one thing that's really important is to carefully monitor all of the one-time staffing and community partnerships getting paid out of those one-time grants and making sure that we have a strategy for once those funds go away. And this slide shows a little history of um, our uh, one-time COVID-19 relief funding, as well as the post-pandemic one-time block grants that we've received. So this, these are uh, statewide um, amounts on the bottom. And we can see really um, during COVID, um, we received um, large uh, um, uh, cash uh, influxes, both from the federal government through the American Rescue Plan, as well as from the state. Um, and it was geared towards addressing not only um, uh, challenges from the pandemic, but the learning loss that um, resulted afterwards. So we have ESSER remaining that we will be um, expending through September on board approved um, capital outlay projects. And then we have a series of one-time block grants that we received um, uh, between 21 and 22. Um, and those were out of um, the capital gains that the state uh, realized um, in their revenues that were that were unexpected. Um, and one thing I wanted to know about the one-time block grants is districts cannot apply for those. Um, those are apportioned out by the state based on enrollment or ADA. So um, this is included in the budget binder narrative. Um, it's a listing of all of this one-time staffing and the one-time community partnerships out of our COVID-19 dollars um, and our current plan for those. So this hasn't changed since first interim. And I wanted to just give um, a little bit of a view into what's happening statewide. So these headlines are just from March. So these are just from the last two weeks. And we can see statewide that we are not the only district that is going to start heading into um, some difficult um, decisions. So what we can see is because of the combination of um, the huge influxes of the one-time funding that masked a lot of the challenges of the, de of the declining enrollment, um, as well as um, uh, the continued declining enrollment that most school districts are facing, um, we can start to see how school districts are, are experiencing some difficulties. Um, this is also just related to how schools are funded. Um, there are a lot of issues around being funded based on average daily attendance when we staff um, according to enrollment. Um, we, we fill classrooms based on enrollment, not how many days a student is actually in attendance. Um, so that's one big issue. Another big issue is um, our special education costs. We have our most vulnerable students who deserve um, a fair and equitable education. And the federal government um, is not fulfilling their federal mandate of how much they promise to fund. So unfortunately, because of that, the um, obligation is falling on local districts, on our local funding out of our LCFF. Um, another issue um, that that we're all seeing is um, uh, some of uh, um, what's happening because of Prop 13 that passed. So I know one thing that a lot of school communities are doing um, is they're continuing to lobby with the state around issues of how schools are funded. Um, and I know AFT and CSCA have been um, very heavily lobbying on behalf of our school communities. So looking um, at what's happening statewide, what we're starting to see in our district, what we are seeing in our neighboring district here in the county, um, and what's happening with that school community. Um, I wanted to give um, an early look at 2627. So we are going to see 2627 um, for the first time in June when they bring 2425 adopted budget um, to board. So what we can see at that point 
is our deficit spending is going to increase because our revenues are dropping and our costs are just continuing to increase. So at that time, um, we are expected at the rate that we're going to possibly not meet our 3% uh, mandated reserve. Um, to be honest, I think for that I'm not too concerned because we are going to see more savings from vacancies. I think where my greater concern lies is a continued um, rate of deficit spending. So we can see in 25-26 in the unrestricted general fund, um, we're seeing um, we're deficit spending by about 16 million. By 26, 27, that's likely to be closer to 19 million at the rate that we're going. Um, one thing I, I think that we really have in our favor is we have very healthy reserves. We have sufficient reserves to help us weather the storm. And I really want to thank our current and prior board and our prior administration for really prioritizing having sufficient reserves because the reserves are doing what they were supposed to do. We have um, been hit with something very unexpected, which is a $44 billion revenue shortfall at the state level. And our reserves are giving us the time to be able to um, formulate a really thoughtful plan. So we're not having to rush into anything with our backs against the wall. So that we have the time to really seek community input and be transparent and work with all of our community partners. So thank you. And another thing I wanted to point out is we are creating the budget based on um, the most available assumptions and planning factors that we have in the moment. So there's a really um, widely known saying in the, in the um, financial world that the minute you print a budget, it's already out of date. So I brought a prop, it's just a pencil. But, <laughs> but um, what Leanne Reyes, who's a deputy superintendent of business services at the COE, um, what, she what she says is, if you imagine the MYP along this pencil with the current budget year closest to the fulcrum, there's less swing in the current budget year because we know all of the factors. We know our enrollment. We know our COLA. Um, we know what our current needs are. And the further out you go, it does become more volatile. So there are things that could happen that could shift the situation for us. We could see higher enrollment come in. The state could um, get an influx of cash. The, the stock market to do, could do really, really well and we could get a series of one-time funding or a higher COLA. So those are all definitely things that could happen, and throughout the budget cycle process, um, uh, we would be um, regularly updating you and the community on those factors. So this is just talking a little bit about um, between now and our adopted budget, um, what is the plan? So the plan is to look at opportunities um, to restructure or right size staffing through current vacancies, as well as identifying qualifying one-time expenditures that we can um, move um, from our unrestricted general fund into possibly other funds or allowable restricted resources um, so that we can make sure that we're meeting our 3% uh, reserve for 26-27 our adopted budget. So what, what does the road um, ahead look for us? So we've started very preliminary um, steps to create a sustainable budget plan and process. So phase one is where we're currently at, which is identifying immediate savings that we can realize. And phase two is really where the hard work is going to begin. And this is where um, we have to um, establish very clear and transparent guidelines for our community, um, for the board, um, and for our staff. Um, and we are looking to establish a budget advisory committee to, and make sure that we have representatives from um, not only our board, but also our students, parents, um, our teachers, classified staff, our bargaining units, leadership, and community partners. 
Um, and through community um, input, um, through other means such as focus groups and surveys, um, we will, um, that will all help us establish what the district's priorities are. And then through 24, 25 through 26, 27, we will continue to monitor uh, uh, budget assumptions and planning factors to keep our school community informed. And throughout all of this, um, we will keep um, our priorities student-centered. And one thing I wanted to just point out um, is that um, because, like I mentioned, we have the healthy reserves, this enables us to be proactive. And really what this process is meant for is to help create a list of what our, what our priorities are so that we can strategically implement um, on a tiered basis over multiple years so that we're not doing this all at once. Because like I said, those um, assumptions and planning factors can change. So we want to make sure that um, we're giving ourselves time to kind of see what happens in those out years before we have to make those decisions. And because of our reserves, um, our district is not going to be facing any layoffs going into 24, 25. So I just wanted to make that very clear related um, to the sustainable budget plan. And these are our priorities um, going into creating the sustainable budget plan, um, which, will, which is most importantly to have the least impact possible on our student outcomes and achievement. Um, to maintain a quality and equi equitable education uh, program and ensure con continuity of core services, prioritize students with the highest needs, and to preserve our workforce as much as possible. Um, and I, what I saw here today, we have very strong student and family voices as demonstrated tonight. We have educators, classified staff, and leadership who are powerful advocates for our students and school community. So our charge right now is to learn from what is happening statewide and to districts even within our own county and to make sure that we are addressing this head on and to be as proactive as possible. So staff recommendation, this is an action item for the second and term budget report. It is respectfully requested um, that the board um, certify with a positive certification. And our next steps, um, the May revision budget uh, update will be released. We will incorporate that into the adopted budget, um, as well as the 2425 LCAP, which is um, being uh, written with community input. Um, and the district will begin the steps to establish a budget advisory committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ein. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we have two for agenda item 9.2. Uh, first of all, Sean Henry. First thing I'd like to say, it was a very good presentation by Ms. Imes, so it's, uh, we, we're, we don't have our CBO, but that was a great presentation. Um, it's, all this is very important, especially since we're talking about um, the uh, declining enrollment, and that's a huge variable, and once you go into that, it's, it sometimes can be like a, a downward spiral. It's very hard to get out of it, um, so uh, we have to look at caution. And so one of the things I do want to address is, is that was said, I, I'm going to decide it. I'm a school psychologist. I was actually born in 1975, the year that actually um, uh, the last major educational civil rights was passed. And so basically there's this fallacy that goes around that the federal government isn't paying its fair share of 40%. Now, we were talking about ethnic studies here. So guess what? The federal government doesn't always follow through on its promises. And so that's something we need to learn. That was just a budgetary gimmick to get it done because there were millions of kids that basically weren't even educated. And all these states were saying, what are we going to do with these millions of kids that have, we've just basically said, take them home. That, ch that child is too 
blank, 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 too stupid, whatever, you know, whatever derogatory reasons they made at that time, no ch there were children that weren't considered educatable. And the federal government a lot of times does very bad unfunded mandates. But in this case, this is a wonderful mandate. They got it done and they got kids in by 19, it wasn't until 1979 that every kid had the right to a public education. So it gets really irritating to hear it brought up all the time and it almost puts the blame on the families, the students, and the staff that it costs more to give an equitable education. So let's get away from this. It's almost 50 years. Let's stop using the blame game and identify that it was a good decision to say that and 20% is enough for the federal government to pay. There are children. Next up we have Brandon Denise. Sean is much taller than me. Um, good evening and thank you to the board. Um, Brandon Denise, grievance officer for the PVFT. Um, first, I'd like to thank Ginny Eim for her presentation. It's really detailed and thorough. I mean, when you first download that document and you see it's over 200 pages, you're like, oh my God. But the, the narrative was really helpful, so we, we really appreciate um, Ginny. Um, we're cognizant of declining enrollment and the effect on our LCFF funding. Um, and several things I'd like to address in regards to the budget. Um, in each interim report, we are provided a projected budget for future years. Um, that's also the case tonight, and it is helpful to see where we are and where we're going. Um, and I'd like to point out that in future years, fail to budget for a negotiated increase for either of our bargaining units. However, the administrative and managerial increases were already budgeted this year even though negotiations with both labor representatives had not been finalized. Um, hold on, I lost myself. What an off-the-wall idea if like, you think that your employer may come to you with a proposed raise that they have already budgeted, knowing the value that you bring to the table. In order to do that, allow me to make a suggestion give up on the personal necessity day arbitration and grievance, which is inevitably gonna waste district dollars that could be put towards our students, to our staff, and towards maintaining a responsible budget. Um, trust your employees that they have their best interests at heart, and when people take a personal necessity day, it is for a reason of compelling personal need. We educate our members about the rules and what is in contract and nobody's taking a personal necessity day just because they have a reason of compelling personal need and so we just ask that you respect your teachers you respect your staff drop that grievance arbitration and let's save some money there too thank you thank you both Sean and Brendan um, was that all of our public speakers yes okay then I will bring it back to the board for deliberation, discussion, questions, comments, concerns. Trustee Bellano Scow. Yeah, thank you for a great presentation. Um, on the committee, uh, what's the next steps on the committee? Do, do you or Superintendent Sheckman want to on forming the committee? Where? and the process on that. I just mm -hmm. think that'd be nice for the board to be involved and I want to thank Superintendent Checkman for taking me up on that suggestion, uh, which I got from Santa Cruz City Schools. Stay there, Jenny. The the first step is to say we approve and accept the report and naturally and the do. obstacles and difficulties. The, I think the next step is really to look at our community. Who do you folks yeah. want to see involved obviously we're going to want our leadership involved we're going to want brandon brandon left oh okay yeah. we want union leadership we want them to pick yeah. people to be involved we want people in the community so that might be a good step at this time to identify people and look for volunteers i, I think it's super important i think yeah it'd be nice to bring that item back to the that specific item so we okay. can keep discussing that it's super super exciting it was exciting but important uh, to have input and transparency. Um, that was my main question. Uh, any other questions? I'll come back if I think of my other question. Sorry, it's late. No worries. Thank you, Trustee Bolanowski. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa. 
So one of the, I love the headlines. That was super helpful to see what's happening sort of around the state. And I look, I'm looking at like San Diego Unified, and that's very striking. They need to close a $94 million budget gap. I'm glad that doesn't say Pajaro Valley. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. So we're still positive. I saw that. Yes. But do we have a, any budget gap at this point? I mean, I know we're deficit spending mm -hmm. on, in the out years, but we don't have a, any type of budget gap like what we're seeing here. So, um, so essentially our um, deficit spending, that is what would be considered the budget shortfall. So um, right now what we're seeing is it's growing each year um, in the subsequent year because of the declining uh, revenue. Sure, mm -hmm. <coughs> but 6.5 6 compared to 94, like, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so my next question is in prior years when we've had a budget shortfall or we, we project it, um, the administration prepares document for us that talks about how we're going to address and what the options are on there. Is, are we, will we see something like that come forward to us, like attrition, elimination of, of position? Yes, you will. Okay. When can we expect that? And that will really um, be part of the process and phase two with, um, with input through the community. Um, I think one thing that um, we really, as a district, one is um, we don't want to just surprise anybody with um, things that are decided, I think, um, behind closed doors. Um, and it's, I think it's really valuable to, to get that kind of input. And, and through the budget advisory committee process and through the focus groups and surveys, um, it will help us establish a priority list um, to start working off of. Okay, but we have early priority lists that we know are low-hanging fruit, do we not? About yes. ways mm -hmm. to yes, and that will be um, uh, brought forward at estimated actuals and adopted budget in June. So those are going to be mostly um, non-positional, uh, low-hanging fruit, or kind of the easy one-time expenditures that we can move out of the unrestricted general fund into possibly other funds or other um, restricted resources. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeServa. Trustee Dr. Holm? Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I'm, I, I, I'm a visual person. I loved the pencil <laughs> example, <laughs> but I, I think it's a, you make a really important point, you know, and just the volatility of the projections. And it's like you know we, you know, those of us who been on the board for a while, it's like we've had you know experiences where it's like, all right, there's gloom and doom, and then it turned out okay. And we also, you know. Just you know, I know personally, having you know been through, you know, financial stuff. Well, it's like, okay, well, there's gloom and doom. Oh, it's going to be fine. Yes. And then not only was it not fine, but it was even really more not <laughs> fine than was projected. So we, you know, that volatility. Sometimes it goes back up, but then sometimes it's been absolutely. Down. And we definitely saw that um, during COVID. So um, right before. Um, or right when the pandemic happened, um, school districts were hearing from the state that um, there would be deferrals, possibly a negative COLA. Um, so um, a lot of districts were bringing um, scary looking budgets to board. I think actually happened here back in 1920. Um, and then pretty much immediately after, all of the one-time um, relief funding from the federal government and the state started rolling in. And kind of what this shows is each year, there was unexpected kind of influx of cash coming in, um, almost faster than most school districts were able to spend it. Um, and that really not only did it mask some of um, the impacts of declining enrollment, but it also for a lot of districts, because they were able to utilize restricted sources instead of unrestricted for certain types of services, um, a lot of districts were able to build up healthy reserves, which I'm really happy to see PV was able to do. And I'm sure our new superintendent coming in is very thankful that um, they are walking into um, uh, a district where we do have the time to come up with the with the clear plan. And I, I just really appreciate the, you know, just the, the clear 
you know, breakdowns of the information. And I think as we kind of especially go into a volatile period, I think having that, you know, we've had from our constituents just that demand appropriately so for transparency and having that clarity of communication is really important. So thank you. Quick clarification. Is it M or I? M, thank you. Okay. So, and so thank you for, for that. And, um, and just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Did I pronounce it incorrectly? I don't know. Oh. M. Yes. Okay. Trustee Bellano Scout. Uh, just a question or, or, or a comment on the projections on population. We, knew, we use a demographer. I understand that. And I know at the beginning of this year there was a little bit of discrepancy as to what the real enrollment was. If I remember correctly, is because there, there's a different number when you include the charter schools. Correct. When you include the charter schools, the declining enrollment is not as bad? Correct. We're still so, declining, but the charter schools are holding their own. So that's an important, and I know it's not a finance question, but that's a board question. It's a question of our next superintendent as we talk about goals and, ha and making sure our schools are attractive. And so that's why I couldn't resist earlier this five hours ago when this meeting started talking about my morning at Calabasas Elementary. Which is very, the, the vibe on that school, people drive all across town to send their kids to that school because of, of the great things that are happening there, including arts and music for all the kids. And so that's a quality, educational quality question that we need to figure out at all of our okay. elementary schools. So we as people, we want people to come into our schools that are, we're getting money from. So I just, important point for the board. Thank if you. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scout. Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for the presentation. I myself like to see pictures and headlines, and you know, puts a little bit more um, input into it. But um, you know, hopefully, people know what's coming. You know, we're, we're being shown it tonight, and so hopefully, the public understands. You know what's coming down the road. So, thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. I'll make a motion to. Oh, okay. Well, uh, is that all comment? I have a fr uh, yeah, you do. So uh, let's just go with it. I think Trustee Dr. Holm is making a first. So I'll, I'll honor that. Trustee Bolano Scow, were you seconding or, or, or you were? I'll second. Okay. So I have a first and second, but I think there's more discussion. I do. I do. <laughs> I do. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, sorry. Just we have. Uh, Okay, um, so I'm sorry, I wanted to um, say, well, I'm not sorry. Um, I want to commend what everybody is here is saying tonight. What a wonderful job, great presentation. I love the demonstration. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Um, and I, you know, I also really am enamored with your movement towards this transparency. I think, I don't think, I know, I mean, I've heard the criticisms. This is something this district for a long time has been criticized about even before I was here. So I really like that direction and movement, especially with you being the director of fiscal services. Also want to thank you for, I mean, just really stepping up to this plate for this district and everything you are doing and helping to hold this district up in a fiscally sound way and the taking care of the finances. I don't know if really many people understand what goes into that and how intelling that is. So I just want to personally thank you for really stepping up and doing that for this district. Thank you so much. Um, I, um, and I also loved the, the budget advisory committee. I didn't realize that that had come from you and direction or how that came about, but I love that. And I think that goes hand in hand with that transparency. And I agree, I would support that. Let's bring that back and have a discussion of identifying those stakeholders and who's involved with that. Um, two questions I did have, um, and I did hear you emphasize the healthy reserves. I, and I know we, I, I think all of us know about the required 3%. Are we still doing the additional 3%? I can't recall if the board removed that or if, or if we're still doing it. I'm sorry. Um, so we, we still have that um, as part of the committed um, component of our unrestricted fund balance. So um, it's not an additional 3%. 
um, at the moment, it was 3% oh, back was in. The, yeah. yes, so thank you for the clarification. So it's about 6.8 was, million. Right, it was mm -hmm. the one time that it was done, mm -hmm. and that's just still sitting there is what you're saying. It is. Mm -hmm. And was that just over one school year? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. it was established back in 1617. Um, so essentially what it does is in our ending um, fund balance on the unrestricted side, that 6.8 just kind of sits there each year. So it's not an additional 6.8 added every year, it's just, it just kind of stays um, the same. And I think I'd asked this question before, are, are we reaping any benefits of compounding effects for that money? Yeah, so all of our um, cash um, sits um, with the county treasurer, and we do receive interest. Okay, so that's a good, healthy thing. Yes. Okay. Um, and it's not, I don't think I'm hearing you proposing that we should consider another additional 3% on top of that at this mo moment. Um, I, I think or probably Or where there's really that, room for it. Mm -hmm. I think that there's definitely room. So what we're seeing is, um, you know, Going into the next few years, we are going. Oops, sorry, we are going to be um, deficit spending. So, at adopted budget. I was planning on bringing um, a resolution at that time to uh, possibly commit um, some additional funds um, to maintain staffing um, into next year. Okay. And you also mentioned in there about an exit strategy and what is that? So, are you suggesting that that the said budget advisory committee should be a part of that strategy of coming up? to what that is. I'm not sure if I was interpreting that exactly correct. Can we get to you? Right, nice. Yes. Um, yes, so that was because of the one-time money that, and so many of our community partners have become dependent on from us that that's just, that's gone. That's not there anymore. Yes, and um, that is one of um, the challenges that a lot of school districts are seeing. So when we received, um, the ELOG and the ESSER um, from the COVID-19 uh, relief one-time funding. A lot of that funding was geared towards um, providing um, uh, uh, socio-emotional support, intervention services, um, really increased and improved services or supplemental services to address um, the learning loss that the students were experiencing um, from working, or not working from home, from learning from home. So what we can see in this chart is we did have um, many services that we were able to either extend or initiate because of our ELOG and our ESSER. So thankfully, um, we received the one-time learning recovery block grant um, that is absorbing a lot of those services um, for the next um, three to four years. So um, that is going to kind of extend the amount of time that we're able to provide those services. And right now, um, uh, what we're going to do is we have um, ESSER projects that are still ongoing. So those are the construction projects. Um, so at estimated actuals, we will see some savings from some of the construction projects finishing under bid. So some of those savings may be able to absorb um, some of the one-time contracts or the staffing so we can extend possibly um, another year. And, and you s sort of already touched on it. You talked about the block grant funding because that was the first thing I was thinking was there any grant possibilities to help absorb some of this? Um, so additional to mm -hmm. what maybe you've spoken about? Mm -hmm. um, so we have um, an amazing um, uh, um, staff member um, Andrea Wiley, who really goes out for every grant that's um, that's available, as well as um, our program leads and and cabinet. Um, so with the one-time block grant, um, those are not ones that we can apply for. Um, this the state apportions those based on enrollment and EDA um, uh, on excess revenues that they received in a certain year. Um, we are certainly going out for um, available grants. Um, one of the concerns sometimes about grants is a lot of them, especially federal grants, have match requirements or um, in-kind requirements. And essentially what that means is um, they require that the district expend a certain percentage and they'll match. So sometimes we have to really evaluate to make sure that we have the resources available to even meet that match um, to go out for that grant. Right, mm -hmm. all right, great, well, wonderful. Is, are there any other comments before I call for the vote? 
Okay, well, and thank you again for a wonderful presentation. And um, again, I can't thank you enough for all you're doing for our district. So we have a first and we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Thank you, it carries 502. And you get to stay with us for the next item, Ooh. next few items. <laughs> Um, now we will move to, f uh, excuse me, 9.3 approved resolution number 23-24-29 temporary borrowing between funds for fiscal year 24-25 and this report will be presented by the director, director of fiscal service, Ms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this resolution um, for temporary borrowing between funds, um, this is an um, annual resolution that is brought to board each year. Um, this is a standard um, practice that a lot of school districts do um, because certain funds and certain types of funding, we receive apportionments um, um, on a set s uh, schedule. So we might receive, let's say for property taxes, usually there's two big months in a year that we receive those. Um, so what this allows is for us to move uh, funds between um, our different kind of sources. Is that all? Yes. Perfect. Um, do we have any public, s public speakers on this item? No, we don't. Okay, see none, then I will bring it back to the board for any questions, comments, discussion, deliberation. I'll move to approve. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, and I and the v motion carries four. Any, I'm sorry, any ob objections? I, I thought I heard all four. No one abstaining. So that will carry four, zero, three. And now item 9.4 to approve resolution number 23-24-30, temporary cash borrowing from Santa Cruz County Treasurer for the fiscal year 24 25, and again, this report will be per presented by Director of Fiscal Service, Ms. Eng. Thank you. Um, so this um, is um, also an annual resolution that we bring to board. This one we put into place um, just in case we ever need um, an influx of cash. Um, it, it might be due to possibly um, revenue deferrals. We were possibly facing that during the pandemic. Um, or if something were to happen to one of our major uh, funding sources. Um, so this typically isn't used uh, most years, but it's just something we like to have in place. Okay, thank you. And do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. Okay. Make a motion to approve. <laughs> I'll bring it back to the board. I have a motion. Do I have a second? A second. Okay, is there any discussion from the board before I call for a vote? No, seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No objections, no abstentions. That will carry 502. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. And I think she has one more. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yes, 9.5. Uh, num resolution number 23 24 31. Temporary cash barn from the Santa Cruz County. Office of Education for fiscal year 24-25. And again, this report will be presented by our Director of Fiscal, Ser Director of Fiscal Services, Ms. Ein. Thank you. After the last Monday in April of each year, um, school districts are no longer able to potentially borrow money from the county treasurer. So what this is, um, is just to have um, something in place just in case we need to borrow cash between April 28th to June 30th um, from the COE, and they have authorized up to $5 million to each school district. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we don't. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and discussion. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Is there any um, deliberation from the board or questions or comments before I call for a vote? See none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? See none, it carries 502. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Um, I will now move to item 9.6, approved tentative agreement with CSEA chapter 132. And this report will be presented by our interim assistant superintendent of human resources, Mr. Sexton. Welcome. Good evening, President Costa. Interim Superintendent Sheckman and Board of Trustees. I will be with you for the next five items. So uh, away we go. So the first item I'm presenting is our um, agreement with CSEA. We're proud to announce that we did settle our negotiations. Uh, they ratified the agreement 
and so we are bringing it to you uh, in your board docs it does reflect um, the items that we finalized just some highlights we did finalize pay and allowance uh, giving them a 5% uh, raise along with a one-time payment of $4,000 um, as well as a supplemental one-time payment for supplemental work that they performed going back to July 1st um, as um, we also uh, settled on a tentative agreement MOU for our split shifts and overtime which was also included in your packet there were no changes to health and welfare benefits and we did have an article on uh, bilingual but that was withdrew so we're excited to uh, request your approval of this agreement Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we don't. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board for discussion. Deliberation, questions, comments? Um, congratulations on both sides agreeing. Um, Thank you. I see there's no changes to health and welfare. Correct. Um, and it looks like some of our classified members will be getting $8,000, right? For off school. Eight thousand. It, well, it says four thousand, going back to twenty twenty three, and then twenty twenty four, an additional four. No, so, oh yeah. yes. So the twenty twenty three twenty four is our um, workers who work a traditional school year, mm -hmm. our classified employees, right? The twenty twenty four season is for our seasonal employees who work, um, who are actually coming back on to work right now for the migrant seasonal. Oh, okay. Buena Vista. Sorry, that was yeah. Not we clear. we um, delineated that because it. They don't, they work, they cross school years. So we wanted to make sure that that was recognized in our agreement. Okay. Well, yeah. it looks like a, a nice raise and no change to benefits. And so anyway, congratulations to everybody. I'd like to make a motion to approve. I have a motion to approve. Trustee I'll, I'll second, I have a question. I don't know if sure. you know the answer off the top of your head, but I'd, I'd be curious what the median uh, salary is for the bargaining unit, the classified bargaining unit. I do not have that answer off no. the top of my head. But I'm sure Jenny and I can figure it out and well, get it back to you. Appreciate it. It'd be great yeah. to know. Thank okay. you. Second. Wonderful. I have a first and second, but I'd like to see if there's other comments. No? Mm -hmm. Trustee Dodge Jr.? Yeah. Happy we got this done. So thank you. Yeah, guys. we are too. Yeah, I just want to um, uh, make a comment and just, um, you know, applaud our. Um, folks at CSEA, um, both their e-board, their leadership, as well as their members for their endurance for this past year going through these negotiations and yes, how appreciative and I am personally of all of them and the, the hard work they do in our district every day. Yeah, they have quite a, a big contingent who come to every meeting and are very involved and um, we had lots of meetings and they were long and, and uh, but we got it done. Yes, I want to thank them for enduring that both the leadership and the membership. So I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right, that will carry 502. Moving on to the next item. Let me put my glasses on. 9.7, approved total compensation for non-management, confidential, and professional service employee groups and as our interim assistant superintendent of HR said, Mr. Sackton, he will be here with us for this. Good evening again. Um, so this is a very similar, uh, these are staff that are um, not represented, so that's non-management confidential, that is uh, our HR executive assistant and the superintendent executive assistant, and then our professional services, which are athletic trainers, our mental health clinicians, and our impact resource officer who works out of the superintendent office. So they, um, we're updating obviously compensation for all of these employees. So we're um, giving them a 5% raise, the one-time payment, and then if they did any supplemental work, uh, that would also receive the same 5% one-time payment based on whatever supplemental work they did from back in July. So we, uh, we request your approval on this action item as well. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Uh, for agenda item 9.7, we have Sean Henry. Oh. He, we'll make it a name. Okay. Okay. All right. No. Okay. Yeah. So no public fine. speakers. Yeah. Okay. See none. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation, discussion, questions, comments. I'll make a motion. 
to approve. I'll second. Okay. Oops. I have a first and I have a second. Is there any other discussion from the board? Okay. See none. I um, will call for a vote. All those in favor? Sorry. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That will carry on 502. Next, 9.8. Approve total compensation for classified management and certificated management. Again, this report will be presented by Interim Assistant Superintendent of HR, um, Mr. Saxton. All right, good evening one more time. All right, so um, so this is our uh, request for approval for total compensation for classified management and certificated management. This one does not include cabinet. So this, is, um, this would bring our management groups of classified and certificated in line with both the classified and certificated staff bargaining units who have received 5% raise, raises for this year. Um, mm -hmm. So this, com this is, uh, brings them in cycle with the rest of them. So we were asking for um, the 5% raise for classified management and certificate management, and then a one-time off-schedule payment of $4,000. So uh, we respectfully re uh, request your approval of this item. Do you have any public speakers to this item? For 9.8, Sean Henry. Excuse me, it's 9.9. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the three. Like, Keeping me on my toes, huh? So yeah, exactly. OK, yeah, OK, OK. <laughs> Okay. All right. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion, questions, or comments. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. I will second. I have a second. Is there any other deliberation from the board on this? No. I would just like to say something. Yes. Um, you know, we, you know, I, you know, we do need our, you know, we need our principals. We need our department heads. Um, and I plan to support this agenda item, but I also kind of wanted to say that, uh, you know, I received emails, I know, I wasn't sure if they were directed at my colleagues or to me saying how divisive, you know, these type of negotiations and action items. Uh, I was kind of offended by that because I don't make these votes how I feel. Uh, I talk to my constituents, I, I talk to you know, the people in my community, so I, I have a, you know what they what they feel what they tell me and so I just kind of wanted to bring that up and but I, I do plan to support this agenda I, so thank you Tr thank you trustee Dr. Jr. trustee Bolano Scow I just want to say <coughs> in flowing kind of from the budget presentation earlier how the reserves had grown and one of the reasons why the reserves had grown so much is because in my opinion our district were, was not compensating people all that well from top to bottom and this last year, this district, in my opinion, is now compensating people competitively. Uh, I think the, the data shows that. And so with the approval of this, we will have been gi giving management a 20% raise within the last 12 months um, when you combine the 10, the 4.5, or 19.5%. So we're paying competitive wages. It's being reflected. And we offer the best benefits. And we have the lowest vacancy rate we've had in recent years for our teachers. So to this board, good job. Yeah, um, any other comments? I, I too have received um, some reach out from my constituency base of some concerns and I do, and it was also echoed in comments made here earlier tonight. I'm just, I'm very concerned about this sort of inheritant culture of this Me Too movement that when literally the sweat and tears off the backs of our unions have created these negotiations that if there's this reservation in the back of the administration's mind that well we're negotiating on the premise that we're just going to me to everyone and that that's the premises that's holding the basis for how we can negotiate with our unions i have a really deep deep concern with that and there's even cases in the state of California of precedence where districts have been sued over that. So I'm really reserved from supporting this tonight. 
without a further dialogue and conversation on the topic. As we noted earlier tonight, we're missing two trustees. Um, it's just really hard for me to support this right now and the timing of it. And I, I just can't for those reasons. Okay. So, any other comments? All right. I have a first and a second. Yeah, I, I would just like to say, so what group, let's just talk, uh, talk it through for a second. What, sure. group, what group of people are these? These are your certificate and classified managers. This is all of our managers in the district, excluding cabinet. Your principals, mm -hmm. your directors, your coordinators, uh, your Assistant classified directors, directors, Hurley, Sergio, Dan, yeah. um, your maintenance supervisors, Kevin, mm -hmm. Memo. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some people. So these are there. key people. These, these are, are people, people who are held yeah. accountable, who are supervise. Our coordinators, our uh, assistant principals. Yeah. Yeah. We can't run a school district without these people. You cannot. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm yeah. going to support this tonight. It's very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Dr. Holm. What has been um, your read on the recruitment and uh, retention of your, of the people in these positions? The management? Mm -hmm. The read is that it's, we don't get the pools that, that I saw when I first started, mm -hmm. which has only been about four and a half years, but um, when we fly, um, principal pools for, ne we're flying for next year, right? Um, we're getting two or three quality candidates. We may have seven apply, but five of them don't have the, the qualifications. And how does that affect issues of say, like diversity and leadership? Um, I would say it affects them. The less people you have that apply and that you have to choose from, makes it difficult to have a diverse pool, right? So. Um, and then you also have to, when you are bringing those people to the staff of the school site, for instance, you have to really hope that the one person or two people that have applied are really excellent so that they, you know, they have a good chance to get, to get a principal or an assistant principal or director that is a quality person. Are you finding that there, because, you know, we've, we've talked, you know, at meetings before about, like, you know, growing our own, are you finding that you know, we're growing our own, but then they're taking leadership positions in other districts? I haven't seen that. What, I, what I've experienced is I'll have um, teachers come talk to me about like, hey, I'm looking to go into administration, right? I'm interested in being an assistant principal or an academic coordinator or something of that nature. And then we'll sit down and I'll go through, well, this is where you would start salary wise. And let's say they've been here 10 or 12 years, they're on column four and they look at it and they go, well, I'm going to lose money, right, moving into an administrative role. Mm -hmm. So I have to really think about that, right? Do I want to do that because it's a career goal? Um, or do I want to stay in the classroom and have the ability to have a good amount of responsibility but a different position and have the opportunity to make, you know, working in the after-school program or something along those lines? Some of them will say, yes, I'm going to do it because that's a career goal for them. And some will say, well, it's... It's not worth it for me at this point in my, in my career. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Is there any other comments? Trustee Bellano scow I think that's an important point about wanting to, the needing to have a salary to attract people who want to go into administrative leadership. We are seeing on our schools this year in recent years, the main huge gap when you have a great principal and a principal struggles. And it's evident, I won't mention any campuses right now, but <laughs> there are some campuses with outstanding principals. I bragged about one of them earlier, and it makes a huge difference. And so the need to uh, compensate competitively, Luis Medina has helped convince me of that time and time again. So um, I think that's very important. So um, leave it at that. Yeah, I would just like to add one more comment in that I don't think this group of people is currently represented, but that's certainly their right to organize and develop their own union to then negotiate with us. Um, and so anyway, I mean, I think it's easier to do it the way we're doing it because to have to yet negotiate with another union would be <coughs> difficult. 
but um, but that's certainly their right to do that. So uh, I I anyway I support this tonight, and they're valuable to this district, and we need to compensate them fairly. Thank you, Trustee Bolano Scale. Thank you, and Trustee Deserpa. Thank you, and. I, I will echo on what Trustee DeSerpa just last said there, and I know it's been recommended to this group of people in the past, and I would fully support them becoming an organized labor group. It has been done in other areas, other districts. Yeah, there and, are a number of districts who have administrators who have a union. And I, and I would support that, and it will pull, you know, and just like CSA or PBFT, they have to bring to the negotiation table the Me Too movement. They can't, it's not just an inheritance that it's gonna happen. So it would help protect this district from any potential lawsuits that we've seen happen in the state. Um, so I'm sorry, that's just why I'm at where I'm at tonight. I understand. And you know, I have also that duty to protect this district. So of course. Um, when anybody think it's personal, I think, all of our majority, we have a lot of wonderful principals and we've been touring and visiting with some of them who've been wonderful and we're gonna keep doing that once you're back. Um, so this is nothing personal whatsoever and I do believe we need to be paying competitive wages, okay? okay. So I'm gonna call, cause we have a first and second, unless anybody has anything else, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. That's gonna carry four, one, two, Eva. Okay. And the next one, 9.9. .9. You're still with us, still Mr. Here. <laughs> we got two more. Approved to total compensation for cabinet, and this report will be presented by Mr. Saxon, our interim assistant superintendent of HR. All right, good evening once again. So, I almost get to say good morning if I just hang out here for a little longer. Oh my gosh, um, three minutes. Uh, so this is um, along the same line, this is a request to have an ongoing 5% raise added to the cabinet salary schedule. I would like to point out that this is not for the superintendent. The superintendent falls under their own um, contract negotiations. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Unless you're the interim superintendent. So um, this is only for the, th the three cabinet or four cabinet positions, the CBO, the um, assistant soups for elementary, secondary, and human resources. So we, re we respectfully request your approval for this um, total compensation package. Thank you, Mr. Saxon. Do we have any public speakers to this comment? Yeah, I think it's Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're pretty well. We finally got to this one. Yeah, Sean Henry. 9.9, right? You're sure it's this one? Yeah. It is this one. It, it gets a little confusing when you're looking at who's who and who's what. So one of the great things I want to say with the confusion is the great thing is that you separated the last group, our principals and everybody, from the cabinet. And last year that was a little bit of a problem. And what I'm going to basically say why I think you should not approve this is that the cabinet already got a handsome raise. Because in 2021-22, if we want to talk about the Me Too, our teachers said we need to raise the salaries of our lowest teachers and we chose myself included to take a four thousand dollar raise rather than a percentage raise okay and that that helped our lower paid employees and everyone was going to get it And at that time they could have done me too but all the principals and VPs they didn't get they didn't get one because the management had decided the cabinet had decided that wasn't a good deal we want four percent so last year when they came back and they did 4%, well actually, which made it worse personally because as a psychologist, a speech and language therapist, a nurse and a program specialist, we got half the raise. We got 2,000 because we made too much money. So they separated us. So I had an issue with my own union to be like, hey, wait a minute, there's a little bit of a problem here. So last year when they got 4%, somebody in management who makes $150,000 plus made $6,000 plus. So they made more money, $2,000 more, and I lost $2,000 more when I voted to be in solidarity with everybody. So they already got their money. And so the reason why this wasn't brought up last year was because they didn't want to have the optics of having a 19% raise for their cabinet. And that's why they didn't do it. And that's why they're asking for it right now, the 5%. So my, my suggestion is do not give them 5%. Give them 2000 Maybe give us $2,000 back too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. 
Is that the last of our public speakers yes. to this item? Yes. All right. And good morning. And good morning, everyone. With that, I will bring it back to the board for deliberation, discussion, questions, comments. Okay, I'll comment. So um, we have multiple openings on our cabinet. We have uh, three people that are working incredibly hard. We're missing a CBO. Um, I believe our cabinet deserves to have a, a raise, just like everybody else. And I don't know what Sean's talking about with 19%. That is not something that I remember. Five, four, and ten. Add it up. I'm just saying. I don't remember those numbers. Um, so anyway, I'm going to make a motion to approve this because I think it's important to keep valuable people in our district. And I worry that if uh, we do not approve this tonight, I potentially feel like we could lose really good cabinet members. So there you have it. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? The sooner you speak, the sooner you go home. <laughs> As a professor, we always say we hate crickets. <laughs> yeah, if nobody's on, I'll entertain your motions. I'll second. Wait, who? Oh, you did? Okay. Did I make a motion? You did. I think, oh, you, <laughs> you did. did. I think you did, kind of, sort of. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to okay. make a motion to approve. Home second. I second my second. Home second. Okay. I have a first and second. Before I call for a vote, I'd like to bring it back to the board for any discussion or comments. Okay. Well, I've already made my comments. I, I believe in the previous item, okay. so I'm going to stand there. So, given that, I'll now call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. So that's three, two, zero. The motion fails. Three, two, two. Why is it? Oh, wait. I'm sorry. Three, two, two. Yes, it fails. It has to carry by a, a board majority of four or more. All right, moving to item 9.10, approved memorandum of understanding between PBFT and PBST, the return of Pajaro Middle School teachers. Again, this report will be presented by Brian Saxon. Mr. Saxon, our interim assistant superintendent of HR. Good morning, President Acosta. Good morning. Super, intern superintendent, Mr. See, Shuckman, got there. board of trustees. Uh, this is, um, we're proud to announce that PBFT, PBUSD have a memorandum of understanding to provide four optional days for Pajaro Middle School teachers to move back in when it's open, Sergio? When, in anticipation of PMS opening for next year, this will give them time to move out of Lakeview and move back in on some days that are set with the incoming principal or the district so they can get all their stuff, get set up without having to worry about when they're going to do that. So we respectfully request that you would approve this MOU. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No. All right, seeing none, I will bring it back for the board for deliberation, discussion, questions, comments. Make a motion to approve. I have a motion. Do I have a second? A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, that will carry 502. The motion passes. Uh, nine. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hang, st hanging out with us till the morning. Point of order, just could you clarify for the public the, the need on the previous vote, the need for, you said a majority of the board needed to approve? Yeah, it has to pass by four. It's a seven member board. Whether seven members are here or not, it has to pass by four. Does that apply to all votes? Yeah. Except for the one we would have had that needed a supermajority of two-thirds. It's the majority of the, vo the 
Both the majority of the city, it, it's a seven member board. Yeah. It's, seven. it's a seven member board, so all votes have to pass by four or more, with an exception of a, um, such as the bond one, has to pass by a two thirds majority, which is at least five. Yeah, let's do a point of order check. Can you, is we, there we some? We will check, yeah, my understanding. It's okay, Murray. Do you have an understanding, well, my understanding that's similar? Is, although Eva is smarter than me, and is, she's agreeing with our board president. My understanding is you have five people here. It's a majority of the five. We'll it, double check. No, the, the way it works, I'll, I'll give you the point of order of clarification. This is a seven-member school board. Yeah, I, I right, that, right, right. No, no. So I'm just going to reiterate because this is how it ties. This is a seven-member school board. So for any vote to pass, it has to pass by a board majority of four board members or more, regardless of how many are in attendance, with an exception to what we had tonight with the bond resolution, which needs a two-thirds majority, whether because it's a seven-member board, that would require five members to vote in support. If, I hope that clarification makes sense. And it would work the same math if it was a five-member board, it would be three votes it would need to pass anything if it was a five member board and it was a super majority vote with a two thirds thing it would need four members no I, I understand your interpretation my understanding was that it was a majority of the quorum that was present mm -hmm. and so what i'm wondering is I, i'm you're, you're the board president mm -hmm. i hear your interpretation what i'm wondering is if we get you know clarification later and it turns out it's a majority of the quorum sure what, what? Let me, I'll do this for you. I will reach out to our di our board's legal counsel and get clarification from them. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Everybody's good. Okay. Now are, are we moving on to item nine point eleven update to board policy six one five eight independent study. This report will be presented by our executive director of teaching and learning, Miss Peggy Pugh. Good Hi. Good evening. Good, evening. good morning. Uh, President evening. Acosta, interim superintendent and trustees and cabinet. Um, I brought this to you two weeks ago at the last regular board meeting as a first read. Um, no changes have been made. Um, and so I submit to you tonight um, the changes as described and as attached in the packet for an update to board policy 6158 regarding independent study. Is that it? That's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and discussion. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, I have a first and a second. Um, any other discussion or questions or anything from the board? No? All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? That will carry 502. Thank you very Thank much, Ms. Hugh. And then item 912 um, rate category two network installation projects. And this report will be presented by our Director of Technology, Mr. Weiser. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, President Acosta, members of the board, and Superintendent Checkman. My name is Dan Weiser. I'm the Director of Technology. And every March, I have the pleasure of bringing forward our E-Rate application, which is a federally funded discount program that the, the, the district qualifies for an 85% discount on all infrastructure that provides internet connectivity and telecommunication connectivity to our classrooms and our schools and our facilities. Um, this is what's called Category 2 internet access, which it, it's really hardware and cabling. So all of the switches and wireless access points and infrastructure that connects um, all of our classrooms and actually outdoor spaces to, to the, uh, the network and to the internet. Um, we're very fortunate that we've qualified for such a high level of uh, discount through the E-rate program for many years. And it's what's allowed us to have such a robust and really kind of enterprise level network for all of our schools. Um, this year, this application is some really critical components for our core. It's actually our core switch, so that's everything that, that comes into the district office, every school site. It supports the wireless and wired connectivity for every connection across our entire network. And then there's other wireless infrastructure and specific schools that we're now bringing up to the, the current standard of, of network connectivity. 
Um, and so the district, the total for these, this project, is, it's, it's 478000 um, but because we get an 85% discount, it costs uh, the district 71000 and that's all still paid for out of Measure L bond funds, so it doesn't impact the, the general fund at all. So I am bringing this forward for your consideration and hopefully for your approval. Thank you, Mr. Reiser. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation discussion. Any questions, comments, or Trustee DeSerpa? I think this is off subject, but is there any news on the tower, the cell phone tower at Aptos High? There isn't. I mean, it's still in the works, and there's still from what I understand, it's still it's still moving forward. Did but it get did it get started? Is it underway? They haven't started the construction yet. Now there's still some kind of permit issues that they're working through and stuff like that. Okay. PG&E issues, I believe. Well, this E-rate program has been a godsend for our district, and um, I fully support it. Thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you for going after the money every year, and I make a motion to approve. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. I have a motion to approve. Does I have any other questions or comments from the board, or a second? I have a first and a second. Any other questions or comments from the board before I call for the vote? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstaining? That will carry 502. Thank you, Mr. Weiser, for sticking with us. Um, now I will move us to item 10, our report and discussion items. Our first one, 10.1, the PBUSD transportation plan update. And we will have this report presented by the Director of Transportation himself, Mr. Mark Birch. Welcome. And Good morning, President, oh. Good morning, President Costa, uh, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman. Every year we're to bring back this uh, transportation plan that was adopted, I believe, two years ago. So, okay, go on. So before you this evening is our PBSD transportation plan that reflects our current practices. As a district, PBSD has an existing transportation department providing home to school and school to home transportation. And this number is incorrect. I apologize for this. Instead of 5,000, it should be about 3,500 general ed students and 470 special needs uh, students for well over 35 years. This document is a living document and can be changed and revised as needed. PVSD primarily resides in a widespread rural area that covers a large physical territory. It is clear that there is a critical need to provide safe and reliable home to school transportation. PVSD provides home to school transportation to students using our exist existing robust transportation system that serves students within our district boundaries from designated stops um, using fixed bus routes that are utilizing for students in grades TK, K, 1 through 6, 7th grade, 9th through 12th students. We also use its current transportation system to transport students within the district boundaries who are McKinley Vento, foster youth, and mainstreamed students with disabilities. We also uh, provide transportation with students with disabilities to all students with transportation identified in their IEPs as a related service using our existing system, picking up students at home or at fixed bus stops. PVSD provides bus passes for students to ride the bus to and from and does not charge for bus passes. It's just a tracking system that we have, but there is no charge for that. We also employ a small group of school vehicle drivers. We like to call them the white fleet because they're primarily driving around in vans and sedans. We have these vehicles for students that cannot normally ride the yellow school bus. They may be a little bit farther out or something with a disability that they need to be kind of a one-on-one -on -one in a vehicle. And we're actually hoping to grow this category even more to get some more of these vehicles out there. Let's. Our training program. 
So it is a value of approximately $5,000. Um, I brought this last year. It's minimum of 20 hours of classroom time by state law and also 20 hours of behind the wheel instruction. That's a minimum. We generally go over that because there is so much information to be given to the trainees that it just, it, 20 hours is almost impossible to do it in. Included in that is a four written tests with the DMV and then two additional tests and driving tests with the CHP. When we generally hold a class, we've been having 30 plus applicants come in. Reality, when it's all over and done with, we end up with three to five students. Once they find out all the background checks, drug testing, all the requirements, they start falling off. Some of the obstacles that we've been running into is CHP. We're still having a hard time getting testing dates. We have one officer for the entire Santa Cruz County. And we reach out to them or to this gentleman and, hey, we'd like to have a test date. Email me at the end of the month. I only want it a week ahead of time. Our hands are tied. We have people ready to go and our office here, CHP, is holding us back. Currently, which is some good news, we just had a gentleman pass, became a certified school bus driver, that is good news. We have two more going this Thursday to be tested, and two more that'll be tested at the end of the month. We do not have a test date for them, because CHP says, email me at the end of the month. He only does it like a week out, and that is very frustrating. I reached out to other districts, same thing. They're having problems too. But we're trying to build up our, what do you call it? Numbers that are for drivers. We're getting there. Uh, we do, we are, in, have collaboration with CSCA uh, to make sure that everything is working well uh, working closely with the air quality districts in California Energy Commission to secure electric buses to reduce pollution in the air and our carbon footprint and engaging with parents in DLAC at DLAC and Parent Resources Fair to solicit feedback both positive and negative on our process processes to continually evaluate our system. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So this was our, actually our first electric bus that we received um, in 23. So a few little pictures there. Uh, we have a total of eight of them right now. We have two more on the way. So the eight that we have are all mini buses. They can be used for regular ed special needs. It doesn't matter, a bus is a bus. The two other ones that we are receiving our grants are 78 passengers. So we were supposed to receive one today they couldn't make it, so we're hoping the next few weeks we'll be receiving that. The kids love riding on it. We've been getting positive feedbacks from them. Um, very minor little issues with the buses, but the mechanics love it, the drivers love it, and so we're trying to rotate drivers so they can get used to them, because they are really different. <laughs> um, with that, I'd like to invite the board or public for any feedback or questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we don't. Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. And this is not an action item, so I'm just, uh, this is time for the board for deliberation, ask questions, comments. Trustee DeSerpa. Hey, Mark, can you um, go back a couple of slides? I wanna see those new buses again. Mm -hmm. Those kids are so cute. Um, so what, are these electric buses? They're all electric buses, That is so yes. cool. And we have a fleet now of how many? Right now we have eight. Eight. And we're having two more delivered, hopefully by this month or first of the next month. And about how many gas do we still have? Gas ones, we have yes. about 12 gas engine ones. Mm -hmm. The rest are diesel. Got it. But we have some other bigger buses that are Aren't they electric too? No, we've never had, this is our first group of electric buses. We've never had electric, or it's either diesel or gas engines.
Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Trustee Bolano <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. I obviously transportation is uh, a neat a bit there's a, been a lot of consternation about transportation. Mm -hmm. Um, and even though we approved a raise for classified, um, I, I'm still going to be curious. Hopefully that'll boost um, recruitment. Uh, we do have competitors like the Metro. Um, and so I guess my question is on the shift, the way, and maybe this is an HR question, but the way we, should, the way we offer shifts, is there any, f the way we do it, do we have to do it the way we're doing it? Is there a way to make it more flexible or is that a deterrent to some people? I mean, the way it's set right now is we've got our morning runs. Some routes have midday runs on them, kindergarten runs, and that's going to start being reduced because we're going all day kinders, and then we have an afternoon. We have had some people come in and ask, hey, you know, I want to work for you, but I can only work mornings. Great. That, that, it's still going to help us. We'll try and make it work for you. So, I mean, trying to restructure... It's, we're looking for full-time somebody that's going to be able to cover all day long. So the vacancies, we, a lot of the vacancies we have, are, are they all full-time? The, the, the mm -hmm. So currently we have, little I forgot to include this earlier, um, prior to COVID, we had authorized uh, for FTEs uh, 61.5, and we had only eight available prior to COVID. For trainees, uh, we had uh, three FTEs. We had three vacancies for that. As of the 8th of March, we were authorized uh, to have 54.031 full-time, and we had available 16.218. Numbers went down because we've reduced a few routes, and we've also, some of the hours have dropped on the routes. So that's why the numbers have gone so Currently, we have about 16, 17 vacancies. And just because it's late, sorry, if I have mm -hmm. heard, understood you correctly before, so you said if somebody wants to come and they say they can only drive in the morning, we can accommodate that? We can accommodate it. We're really looking to have somebody that could do the whole day. <coughs> you know, if so they the come in only part day, they'd be like a substitute. I gotcha. So gotcha, they wouldn't gotcha. be a full time employee, gotcha. as far as my knowledge goes on that. Um, is there any been a, any update? I think you said just something about update to the routes. Mm -hmm. um, there was I heard some consternation about that a while ago. The way the routes had used to be, and then they were changed in some way. Is there? How do you feel about the routes? Are they are in good shape? Or they're they're in good shape. Um, it, it said that we can't get some of them covered at times. We've actually gone back and looked at all the dispatchers. You know, really look at your routes. Where can we maximize them? Can we combine? Two runs, like Rio de Mar, for an example. There used to be three routes out of that school. We're down to one now because the population has just dropped. They're just not riding. Parents are taking their kids in more. Um, Hall School, for another example, there's eight buses out of there. Where can we possibly condense some? We could send another that one bus that we're saving there to another site that's kind of really impacted. So they've been looking at all different angles. We've asked drivers, what do you, what's your feedback? What do you see out there that could help us? And people have been giving their input on them. So I'm very happy with that. It, it might it make sense in your opinion? Is there any, and I don't know if this has been done before, but is there a way we can, if necessary, partner with Metro on helping cover? I know they do offer free service to PB High School. They, and some of the students are running, taking that which does kind of help us on it. Uh, but from what I've been seeing, I've been hearing also, a lot of those kids are from like the Home Depot Freedom area, going, taking the Metro bus so they're not having to walk. Because we only transport basically from the towers here on up Green Valley because of the walking distance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee Blano Scale. Trustee Dr. Holm. a harder time at this time of the evening <laughs> articulating you know I, I understand. but just you know it's like every time I see our, our, our fleet go by you know whether I'm you know on, on 
the street or just driving by, I have a sense of pride mm -hmm. in our district, you know, the service that we provide to, you know, our students. Um, and it's fun, you know, it's like if, I'm, if I'm jogging in the morning and our drivers, and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, it's just such a sense of community. And it's just so important for access to our public education. And so I, I just want to express my appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee Dodge Jr., do you have any questions or comments? Uh, you can at least thank Mr. Birch for being here at yeah, 12 of course. 30 in the morning. Uh, you know, I, I, I know it's difficult out there trying to get bus routes. You know, um, we hear it. You know, hopefully, you, we can do the best we can. I know you guys are doing the best that you can, the bus drivers in particular. So I just wanted to thank you and the bus drivers for, thank you. you know, going all out and trying to take the kids to school. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, for being here and until 12.30 in the morning. I, aren't you glad that we don't have to be at work before 5 a.m. anymore? He does. <gasps> you do? He does. Oh. I, won't, I won't tell you what time I'm there. Oh, my gosh. Not tomorrow morning. I'm so this sorry. morning, no. Well, but you're not going to be driving any kids anywhere tomorrow morning. <laughs> so. I'm going straight to the yard after this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back over and go to sleep over there now. <laughs> oh, my. All right. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, and thank you, Mark, seriously, though, for sticking out with us tonight and the, the wonderful presentation, and I do think it's an important presentation. I, you know, have a few, you know, comments. Can we go to your slide, right, with the, the requirements for the drivers? Uh, yeah. You know, so I had an interesting situation. Um, I was down in Southern California, and my daughter and I were driving down a street at the time. Clearly, a high school was getting out. And both sides of the street, the metro bus stops were just crazy filled with students. And she was just like, what the heck? I mean, I'm like, I have no idea. I've never seen something like that. But point to no doubt, our, our drivers, our school bus drivers, I mean, this is a statewide thing, not just us, go through so much more rigor and test every five years than metro drivers do. Mm -hmm. And they're getting paid a lot more. Correct. And we are in heavy competition with them. And I would not want to see our most valuable cargo, the world's most valuable cargo, Go being away. on a metro. I mean, they belong. There's a reason this amount of testing is involved and this rigor and the training. And that doesn't also include the continued training, training that, that drivers have to continue to do every year in between and then the prep every five years to get ready for the next test. Um, and I think I know what you're gonna say to me about this, but the, the issue with the, the CHP officer, and I'm not in suggesting we should step on anybody's toes and it might do that, but is it possible that you could reach out to Gilroy's CHP? Because it is CHP, it's a, it's a statewide, but I know it's a region thing. Correct, and we have before, we reached out to Gilroy to Salinas Monterey area. Hey, can we send our drivers over here to be tested? The answer is no, because the application, your, your file resides here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, You're kind of, we have to stay with Santa Cruz County. And is it, uh, is it just an individual, I don't want to put you on the spot no, person, no. or is it, there also, is it also a staffing issue for them? It's a staffing. Our officer seems to be taking a lot of vacation time. Okay. So, and I get it, they get their time off too. But last month he was out on patrol. He was in the office working. So, or before we had the luxury of, we had a dedicated CHP officer. And that's all they did was school bus. Mm -hmm. Very little road work. Now they're kind of being st stretched thin also. So he's only two to three times a month that he's doing testing for the entire county. So like I said, it's just not our district. It's the entire county, which yeah, I, and we begged and pleaded with him. Can we get one extra day or two tests and nothing? I get it. And I know you know I come from a long lineage mm -hmm. of school bus drivers and school bus driver instructors. Right. And my father was the CHP officer um, that was in charge yeah. of all bus drivers. So in Gilroy, right? Gilroy? Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Up until, and then he promoted and made his way to Fresno for to retirement, to retire as a sergeant. But 
anyhow, so it's well, I just want to thank you and all of our class, or all of our bus drivers and people down in transportation for the job you're all doing and getting our most valuable, precious cargo in the world to and from every day safely. And um, you also, best. you're taking care of our after school programs too. Mm -hmm. That part too. So, thank you so much. Go get some shut eye. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank all. you. Good night. Oh. <laughs> Um, now I'll move us to item 10.2, differential graduation and competency standards for students with disabilities, first read of board policy. And this report will be presented to us by our um, SELPA director of special services, um, Ms. Gorman. Hi, welcome. I was hopeful I wrote good evening on my paper here. So good morning, <laughs> President Acosta, interim superintendent Checkman and board of trustees. This is the first read of a proposed update to the board policy 6146.4. And in updating this policy, we will be aligning to current Assembly Bill 181. And because that Assembly Bill passed, the Ed Code has now been updated. And so it's for us to hopefully update our board policies to match the Ed Code and the law. So the vision is that all students with disabilities, including students with significant cognitive disabilities, should enter high school knowing they have the opportunity to earn a high school diploma. And in order to earn this alternative diploma, a student must qualify to take the California Alternative Assessment. That's called the CAA. Um, any student that qualifies for the diploma will follow a standards-based curriculum. I hope to be talking to you guys about that soon. And align with state requirements and will obtain a diploma within the same period of time as their general education peers. This doesn't, however, mean that they won't also have the opportunity to go to the post-secondary um, transition program. So we serve them until the age of 22. So the students that graduate will um, earn this diploma and be eligible for post-secondary. And so this is just the first read. And is that all? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. Right, do we have any public speakers on this item? No, we don't. Okay, seeing none, I will bring it back to the board. This again is not an action item, so it's just a report and discussion, but if you have any questions or comments, now's the time. Oh. Yeah, Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I just have a couple questions. Um, I'm not sure if I can ask this question, but um, how often do you visit school sites? Is that, am I allowed to ask that at this moment? Is it germane to the topic? Okay. Georgia? Is it germane to the topic? Uh, can you relate it to the topic? Uh, if it's a question of a concern or something that you have? It's just, you know, like how often does she visit sites? Okay. I, I, I I'm ask. happy to answer that okay, because I'm sure. out at sites weekly. Okay. Um, yeah. When you I mean, visit sites, are you there just to be visible or oh. just like for specific? So I didn't know it was going to go into details about this. So if, okay. does it have to do with the graduation diploma okay, pathway here? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. Anyone else? Trustee, uh, thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Trustee DeSerpa. One of my favorite um, populations that we mm -hmm. serve. Um, I try to get to the post-secondary graduation every year and it's my favorite one by yeah. far. It's just so sweet. So anyway, thank you for bringing this forward. So this is not a vote, this is just a first read. Yeah. Thank oh. you. It'll come back next, next board meeting. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa. Anyone else? All right, seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Gorman, for being with us. Okay, 34. I will now move us to item 11, the consent agenda. Consent items are routine items coming before the board. Do we have any public speakers to this? No, we don't. Okay. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? None. Okay, can I have a motion to approve? Here's a motion to approve our consent agenda tonight. I have a motion to approve. Can I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, and, oh, and just um, also for the public record, I just want to note a correction to the verbiage on consent agenda item 11.15. 
Um, this item should read as Mellow Joint Powers Authority, JPA, not Mellow Auditorium Oversight Committee. Our friends over at the City of Watsonville noticed this and brought it to my attention, so I just want to make sure we have that correct verbiage on this for the public record. Okay, so I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? The motion carries 502. And we do not have any deferred. Do we do not need to reconvene to closed session. Do we have a report out of closed session? Yes. Closed session item 2.4, expulsion referral. Under closed session agenda item 2.4, the board voted 502 to approve the recommendation from district administration for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the academic year for student number 23-4-017 and 23-4-018. Okay. And, then, and then for closed session item 2.7 regarding resolution number 23-24-32, the board approved the non-reelection of one zero point, sorry, 1.0 FTE certificated probation employee, and I said number. No, and it was a 502 vote. And it was a 502 vote. And now the move. Yep, and now it's been a while since I've done this. <laughs> um, I'd like to motion on closed session item 2.8. I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on March 13th, 2024, with 18 and zero additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That vote will carry 5-0-2. Okay. Motion number two, closed session item 2.9. I move to approve the classified personal report as presented by district administration on March 13th, 2024 with six and 12 additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? That motion will carry 5-0-2. Announcement number one. The PBUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Liz Edinger as the principal for Aptos Junior High School. Liz has been working with students at PBUSD since 2004 when she started as a language art teacher at Aptos Junior High School. Liz has been an integral member of the staff at Aptos Junior during her tenure. In 2022, she became the assistant principal and continued to demonstrate her strong leadership skills. In the fall of 2023, Liz was named the interim principal at Aptos Junior High and now is moving into the per permanent position. Liz holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Humboldt State and a single subject credential in social science, English, and computer concepts and application. Liz holds a preliminary administrative credential from San Diego State Global. We are excited to welcome this highly qualified educator to her, her new position, Go Sea Dragons. And announcement number two, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of, of Joe Gregorio as the new principal of Watsonville High School. Coach. He's not here though. He was. Uh, he was. Mm -hmm. Joe has been serving students since 2004 at Cesar Chavez Middle School. He has also worked at PV High and Watsonville High School. Joe has been an assistant principal at Watsonville High since 2019. <clears throat> and most recently, Joe has been serving as interim principal. Joe holds a a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Cal State Northridge. He obtained a single subject teacher credential in physical education and his administrative services credential from National University. We are excited to have Joe moving to his new role, Go Cats. You want to make an announcement? I would. Okay, Mr. Sheckman, our superintendent, would like to make an announcement. It's like not agendized. Although we, and you offered to, well, it will relate to the agenda. This is from the State Bar of California Board of Trustees Manual, published in November 2023, and I'd like it entered into the record. It will be a good idea, though, to confirm with our attorneys, but voting on motions, it says, with a quorum of the body present at a duly noticed meeting, approval of a motion requires a majority vote of those members who are present and vote. That's been my experience in the Salinas Union High School District. But we will confer and have legal representation interpret. I, I will confer with the board's legal counsel because uh, that hasn't been the past practice of this board. So 
Our next meeting is scheduled for March 27th, 24. And this meeting is adjourned at 12.40 p.m. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. See you all Monday. <laughs>